Part One of Biltmore Oswald, The Diary of a Hapless Recruit. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nigel Boydell. Biltmore Oswald, The Diary of a Hapless Recruit by J. Thorn Smith. Part 1 February 23rd And what? asked the enlisting officer, regarding me as if I had insulted him, his family and his livestock, leads you to believe that you are remotely qualified to join the Navy. At this I almost dropped my cane, which, in the stress of my patriotic preoccupation, I had forgotten to leave home. Nothing, I replied, making a hasty calculation of my numerous useless accomplishments. Nothing at all, sir. That is, nothing to speak of. Of course, I've passed a couple of seasons at Bar Harbour. Perhaps that... Bar Harbour? exploded the officer. Bar, bar, bar. Damn it! He broke off. I'm bleating. Yes, sir, said I with becoming humility. His hostility increased. Do you enlist for foreign service? He snapped. Sure, I replied. It will all be foreign to me. The long line of expectant recruits began to close in upon us until a thirsty, ingratiating semicircle was formed around the officer's desk. Upon the multitude he glared bitterly. Orderly, why can't you keep this line in some sort of shape? Yes, give the old tosh some air, breathed a worthy in my ear as he retreated to his proper place. "'What did you do at Bar Harbour?' asked the officer, fixing me with a gaze. "'Oh,' I replied easily, "'I occasionally yachted.' "'On what kind of boat?' he urged. "'Now, for the life of me, sir, I can't quite recall,' I replied. "'It was a splendid boat, though, a perfect beauty. "'Handsomely fitted up and all. "'I think they called her the Black Wing.' These few little remarks seemed to leave the officer flat. He regarded me with a pitiful expression. There was pain in his eyes. "'You mean to say,' he whispered, "'that you don't know what kind of boat it was?' "'Unfortunately, no, sir,' I replied, "'feeling really sorry for the wounded man. "'Do you recall what was the nature of your activities "'aboard this mysterious craft?' he continued. Oh, indeed I do, sir, I replied. I tended the jib sheet. Ah, said he thoughtfully, sort of specialised on the jib sheet. That's it, sir, said I, feeling things taking a turn for the better. I specialised on the jib sheet. What did you do to this jib sheet? he continued. I clued it, said I promptly, dimly recalling the impassioned instructions an enthusiastic friend of mine had shunted at me throughout the course of one long, hot, horrible, confused afternoon of the past summer, my first and, as I had hoped at the time, final sailing experience. The officer seemed to be lost in reflection. He was probably weighing my last answer. Then, with a heavy sigh, he took my paper and wrote something mysterious upon it. "'I'm going to make an experiment of you,' he said, holding the paper to me. "'You are going to be sort of a test case. You're the worst applicant I have ever had. If the Navy can make a sailor out of you, it can make a sailor out of anybody.' He paused for a moment, then added emphatically, "'Without exception.' Thank you, sir, I replied humbly. Report here, Monday, for physical examination, he continued, waving my thanks aside. And now go away. I accordingly went, but as I did so, I fancied I caught the reflection of a smile lurking guiltily under his moustache. It was the sort of smile, I imagined at the time, that might flicker across the grim visage of a lion in the act of anticipating an approaching trip to a prosperous native village.
February 25th. I never fully appreciated what a truly democratic nation the United States was until I beheld it naked. That is, until I beheld a number of her sons in that condition. Nakedness is the most democratic of all institutions. Not knees, warts and chilblains, bow legs, boils and bay windows are respecters of no caste or creed, but visitors all alike. These profound reflections came to me as I stood with a large gathering of my fellow creatures in the offices of the physical examiner. Never have I seen a more unpromising candidate in all my past experience, said the doctor moodily when I presented myself before him, and thereupon he proceeded to punch me in the ribs with a vigour that seemed to be more personal than professional. When thoroughly exhausted from this, he gave up and led me to the eye charts, which I read with infinite ease through long practice in following the World Series in front of newspaper buildings. "'Eyes all right,' he said in a disappointed voice. "'It must be your feet.' "'These proved to be faultless, as were my ears and teeth.' "'You baffle me,' said the doctor at last, thoroughly discouraged. "'Apparently you are sound all over, yet, looking at you, "'I fail to see how it is possible.' I wondered vaguely if he was paid by the rejection. Then, for no particular reason, he suddenly tired of me and left me with all of my golden youth and glory standing unnoticed in a corner. From here I observed an applicant being put through his ear test. This game is played as follows. A hospital apprentice thrusts one finger into the victim's ear while the doctor hurries down to the end of the room and whispers tragically words that the applicant must repeat. It's a good game, but this fellow I was watching evidently didn't know the rules, and he was taking no chances. Now repeat what I say, said the doctor. Now repeat what I say, quoted the recruit. No, no, not no, cried the doctor. Wait till I whisper. No, no, not no, wait till I whisper answered the recruit, faithfully accurate. "'Wait till I whisper, you blockhead!' shouted the doctor. "'Wait till I whisper, you blockhead!' shouted the recruit with equal heat. "'Oh, God!' cried the doctor despairingly. "'Oh, God!' repeated the recruit in mournful voice. This little drama of cross-purposes might have continued indefinitely had not the hospital apprentice begun to punch the guy in the ribs, shouting as he did so, "'Wait a minute, can't you?' "'At which the recruit, a great hulk of a fellow, "'delivered the hospital apprentice a resounding blow in the stomach "'and turned indignantly to the doctor. "'That man's interfering,' he said in an injured voice. "'Now that ain't fair, is it, Doc?' "'You pass,' said the doctor briefly, "'producing his handkerchief and mopping his brow. "'Well, what are you standing around for?' "'he said a moment later, spying me in the corner. "'Oh, doctor!' I cried, delighted. "'I thought you'd forgotten me.' "'No,' said the doctor. "'I'll never forget you. "'You pass. "'Take your papers and clear out.' "'I can now feel, with a certain degree of security, "'that I am in the Navy.' "'February 26th. "'I brought the news to my mother today, "'and she took it like a little gentleman, "'only crying on twelve different occasions.' I had estimated it much higher than that. After dinner, she read me a list of the things I was to take with me to camp, among which were several sort of life preservers, an electric bed warmer, and a pair of dancing pumps. Why not include spurs? I asked, referring to the pumps. I'd look very crisp in spurs, and they would help me in climbing the rigging. But some officers might ask you to dance, protested Mother. Mother! I replied firmly, I have decided to decline all social engagement during my first weeks in camp. You can send the pumps when I write for them. A card came today ordering me to report on March the 1st. Consequently, I am not quite myself. February 27th 
Mother hurried into my room this morning and started to pack my trunk. She'd gotten five sweaters, three helmets, and two dozen pairs of socks into it before I could stop her. When I explained to her that I wasn't going to take a trunk, she almost broke down. But at least, she said, brightening up, I can go along with you and see that you are nice and comfortable in your room. You seem to think that I am going to some swell boarding school, mother, I replied from the bed. You see, we don't have rooms to ourselves. I understand that we sleep in bays. Don't jest, cried mother. It's too horrible. Then I explained to her that a bay was a compartment of a barracks in which eight human beings and one petty officer, not quite so human, was supposed to dwell in intimacy and, as far as possible, concord. This distressed poor mother dreadfully. But what are you going to take? she cried. I'm going to take a nap, said I, turning over on my pillow. It will be the last one in a bed for a long, long time. At this my mother stuffed a pair of socks in her mouth and left the room hastily. Holly came in tonight, and I kissed her on and off throughout the evening on the strength of my departure. This infuriated father, but mother thought it was very pretty. However, before going to bed, he gave me a handsome wristwatch, and grandfather, pointing to his leg, said, Remember the Mexican War, my boy? I fought and bled honourably in that war, by God, sir. I know for a fact that the dear old gentleman has never been further west than the Mississippi River. February 28th, on the train. I have just gone through my suitcase and taken out some of Mother's last little gifts, such as toilet water, a padded coat hanger, one hot water bottle, some cough syrup, two pairs of ear bobs, a paper vest, and a blue polka-dotted silk muffler. She put them in when I wasn't looking. I have hidden them under the seat. May the Lord forgive me for a faithless son. The departure was moist, but I managed to swim through. I am too excited to read the paper and too rattle-brained to think except in terrified snatches. I wonder if I look different. People seem to be regarding me sympathetically. I recognised two faces on the train. One belonged to Tony, the iceman on our block. The other belongs to one named Tim, a barkeep, if I recall rightly in a hotel I have frequently graced with my presence. I hope their past friendship was not due to professional reasons. It would be nice to talk over old times with them in camp, for I have frequently met the one in the morning after coming home from the other. March the 1st Subjected myself to the intimate scrutiny of another doctor this morning, I used my very best Turkish bath manners. They failed to impress him. Hospital apprentice treating me to a shot of Pelham Hop. It is taken in the customary manner through the arm. Very stimulating. A large sailor held me by the hand for fully 15 minutes. Very embarrassing. He made pictures of my fingers and completely demolished my manicure. From there I passed on to another room. Here a number of men threw clothes at me from all directions. The man with the shoes was a splendid shot. I am no a sailor at least superficially. My trousers were built for Charlie Chaplin. I feel like a masquerade. A gang of recruits shouted 21 days at me as I was being led to mess hall number one. The poor simps had just come in the day before and had not even washed their leggings yet. I shall shout at other recruits tomorrow, though the same thing that they shouted at me today. Our PO is a very terrifying character. He's a stern but just man, I take it. He can tie knots and box the compass and say, pipe down, and everything. Gee, it must be nice to be a real sailor. Fell out of my hammock last night and momentarily interrupted the snoring contest holding sway. I was told to pipe down in Irish, Yiddish, Third Avenue and Bronx. This, I thought, was adding insult to injury but could not make anyone take the same view of it. I hope the thing does not become a habit with me. I form habits so readily. In connection with snoring, I have written the following song, which I am going to send home to Polly. 
I wrote it in the YMCA hut this afternoon while crouching between the feet of two embattled checkers players. I'm going to call it The Rhyme of the Snoring Sailor. It goes like this. The mother thinks of a sailor's son that's clutched in the arms of war. But mother should listen as I have done to the same little innocent sailor's son sprawled in his hammock and snore. Oh, the sailor man is a rugged man, the master of wind and wave. And poets sing till the tea rooms ring of his picturesque deep sea grave. And they likewise rise of the storm at night when the numerous north winds roar. But more profound is the dismal sound of a sea going sailor's snore. Oh, mother's knit for the sailor's son, socks for the nautical toes. But mother should listen to the frightful noise made by their innocent sailor boys, by the wind they blow through their nose. Oh, life at sea is wild and free and greatly to be admired. But I will sleep both sound and deep at night when I'm feeling tired. So here we go with the yo-ho-ho while the waves and the tempest soar. An artist can paint as shrew as a saint, but not camouflage on a snore. Oh, mothers, write to your sons at sea, write to them, I implore. A letter as earnest as it can be, containing a delicate motherly plea, a plea for them not to snore. Oh, I take much pride in my trousers wide, the ladies all think them sweet. And I must admit that I love to sit in a chair and relieve my feet. A vast belay and we're bound away with our hearts lashed fast to the fore. But when mermaids sleep in their bowers deep, do you think that the sweet things snore? Our company commander spoke to us this morning in no uncertain terms. He seems to be such a serious man. There is a peculiar quality in his voice, not unlike the tone of a French 75mm gun. You can easily hear everything he says, miles away. We rested this afternoon. March the 3rd, Sunday, a day of rest, for which I gave, in the words of our indefatigable chaplain, three good rollicking cheers. Some folks are coming up to see me this afternoon. I hear I must moo through the fence at them like a cow. Later. The folks have just left. Mother kept screaming through the wire about my underwear. She seems to have it on her brain. There were several young girls standing right next to her. I really felt I was no longer a bachelor. Why do mothers lay such tremendous stress on underwear? They seem to believe that a son's sole duty to his parents consists in publicly announcing that he is clad in winter flannels. Polly drove up for a moment with Joe Henderson. I hope the draft gets hold of that bird. They were going to have tea at the Baltimore when they got back to the city. I almost bit the end off a sentry's bayonet when I heard this woeful piece of news. Liberty looks a long way off. I made an attempt to write some letters in the YMCA this evening, but gave up before the combined assault of a phonograph, a piano, and the flanking detachment of checker players. Several benches fell on me, and I went to the map feeling very sorry for myself. March the 4th the morning broke badly. I lashed my hand to my hammock and was forced to call on the P.O. to extricate me. He remarked with ill-disguised bitterness that I could think of more ineffectual things to do than any rookie it had been his misfortune to meet. I told him that I didn't have to think of them, they just came naturally. Last night I was nearly frightened out of my hammock by awakening and gazing into the malevolent eye of my high-powered twin six wristwatch. I thought for a moment that the Woolworth Tower had crawled into bed with me. It gave me such a start. I must get used to my wristwatch, also wearing a handkerchief up my sleeve. I feel like the sweet kid himself now. Drill all day. My belt fell off and tripped me up. Why do such things always happen to me? Somebody told us to do squads left and it looked as if we were playing ring around Rosie. Then we performed a fiendish and complicated little quadrille called a company square. I found myself, much to my horror, on the inside of the contraption, walking directly behind the company commander. It was a very delicate situation for a while. I walked on my tiptoes so that he wouldn't hear me. Had he looked around, I know I'd have dropped my gun and lit out for home and mother. Forgot to take my hat off in the mess room. 
I was reminded, though, by several hundred thoughtful people. March 5th. Stood for half an hour in the mail line. Got one letter. A bill from a restaurant for $18 worth of past luncheons. I haven't the heart to write more. March 6th. Bag inspection. I almost put my eye out at right hand salute. However, my bag looked very cute indeed, and although he didn't say anything, I feel sure the inspecting officer thought mine was the best. I had a beautiful embroidered handkerchief holder, prominently displayed, which I'm sure must have knocked him cold. He missed the dirty white, but I'll never be the same. Fire drill. My hammock came unlashed right in front of a CPO, and they asked me if I was going to sleep in it on the spot. It was a very inspiring scene. Particularly thrilling was the picture I caught of a very heavy sailor picking on a poor, innocent-looking little fire extinguisher. He ran the thing right over my foot. I apologised as usual. I discovered that I had been putting half instead of marling hitches in my hammock, but not before the inspecting officer did. He seemed very upset about it. When he asked me why I only put six hitches in my hammock instead of seven, I replied that my rope was short. His reply still burns in my memory. What eloquence! What earnestness! What a day! March 7th. Second jab tomorrow. I am too nervous to write today. More anon. End of part one. Part two of Biltmore Oswald, The Diary of a Hapless Recruit by J. Thorne Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nigel Boydell. Part two. March 16th. Life in the Navy is just one round of engagements to keep. Simply splendid. All we have to do is get up at six o'clock in the morning when it is nice and dark and play around with the cutest little hammock imaginable. When you have arrived at the most interesting part of this game, the four hitch period, and you are wondering whether you are going to beat your previous record and get six instead of five, the bugle blows and immediately throws you into a state of great indecision. The problem is whether to finish the hammock and be reported late for muster, or to attend muster and be reported for not having finished your hammock. The time spent in considering this problem usually results in your trying to do both and in failing to accomplish either, getting reported on two counts. Any enlisted man is entitled to play this game and he is sure of making a score. After running around innumerable miles of early morning camp scenery and losing several buttons from your new trousers, you come back and do Greek dances for a man who aspires to become a second Maudkin or a Mr Isadora Duncan. This is all very sweet and I am sure the boys play prettily together. First he dances, then we dance. Then he interprets a bird and we all flutter back at him. This being done to his apparent satisfaction, we proceed to crawl and grind and weave and wave in a most extraordinary manner. This is designed to give us physical poise to enable us to go aloft in a graceful and pleasing manner. After this dancing in the dew, you return for a few more rounds with your hammock, clean up your bear and stand in line for breakfast. After breakfast we muster again and a gentleman talks to us in a voice that would lead you to believe that he thought we were all hiding somewhere in New Rochelle. Then there are a number of things to do to divert our minds. Scrub hammocks, pick up cigarettes, drill, hike and attend lectures. As a rule we do all of these things from 5pm until 8.45pm. If we are unfortunate enough not to have a lecture party, we are free to give ourselves over to the riotous joy of the moment, which consists of listening to a phonograph swear bitterly at a piano long past its prime. The final act of the drama of the day is performed on the hammock. 
an animated little sketch of arms and legs conducted along the lines of Houdini getting into a straitjacket. Or does he get out of them? I don't know. Perhaps both. Anyway, you get what I mean. March 17th. This spring weather is bringing the birds out in great quantities. They bloomed along the fence today like a Ziegfeld chorus on an outing. One girl carried on a coherent conversation with six different fellows at once and left each of them feeling that he alone had been singled out for her particular favour. As a matter of fact, I was flirting with her all the time and I could tell by the very way she looked that she would have much rather been talking to me. Last week I had to convince Mother that I was wearing my flannels. This week I had to convince her that I still had them on. The only way to satisfy her, I suppose, is to appear before her publicly in them. Poor dear mother, she told me she had written the doctor up here asking him not to squirt my arm full of those horrid little germs any more. She said I had come from a good clean family and had been bathed once a week all my life, except the time when I had the measles and then it wasn't advisable. I'm sure this must have cheered the doctor up tremendously. She also asked him to be sure that I got my meals regularly. I can see him now taking me by the hand and leading me to the mess hall. When I suggested to mother that she write President Wilson, asking him to be sure that my blankets didn't fall off at night, she said that I was a sarcastic, ungrateful boy. March 18th There is something decidedly wrong with me as a sailor. I got my pictures today. Try as I may, I am unable to locate the trouble. There seems to be some item left out. Not enough salt in the mixture, perhaps. I don't know exactly what it was, but I seem to be a little too, may I say, handsome, or perhaps polish would be a better word. I'm afraid to send the pictures away because no one will believe them. They'll think I borrowed the clothes. March 19th a funny thing happened last Sunday that I forgot to record. A girl had her foot on the fence, and when she took it down, everyone yelled, As you were! Sailors have such a delicate sense of humour. Well, that's about enough for today. March 20th We had a lecture on boats today. The only thing I don't know now is how to tell a bilge from a painter. The oar was easy. It's divided into three parts, the stem, the lead and the muzzle. I must remember this, it is very important. The men are getting so used to inoculations around here that they complain when they don't get enough. We are shaping up into a fine body of men. Our company commander told us this morning and added that if we continue to pick up cigarette butts several more weeks, we'll be able to stack arms without dropping our guns. Eli the goat seems unwell today. I attribute his unfortunate condition to his constant and unrelenting efforts to keep the canteen clear of paper. It is my belief that goats are not healthy because of the fact that they eat paper. But in spite of it, and I feel sure that if all goats get together and decide to cut out paper for a while and live on a regular diet, they would be a much more robust race. The movies were great tonight. I saw Sidney Drew's left ear and a mole on the neck of the man in front of me. March 21st A fellow in our bay asked last night how much an admiral's pay was a month and when we told him he yawned, turned over on his side and said, Not enough. He added that he could pick up that much at a first class parade any time. We all tightened our wristwatches. Been blinking at the blinker all evening. Can't make much sense of it. The blooming thing is always two blinks ahead of me. It's all very nice, I dare say, but I'd much rather get my messages on scented paper. I got one today. She called me a great big cute little sailor boy. Those were her exact words. How clever she is. I'm going to marry her just as soon as I'm a junior lieutenant. She'll wait a year anyway. March 22nd. I made up verses to myself in my hammock last night. Perhaps I'll send some of them to the camp paper. 
It would be nice to see your stuff in print. Here's one of the poems. The Unregenerate Sailor Man I take my booze in my overshoes. I'm fond of the taste of rubber. I oil my hair with the grease of bear, or else with a bull whale's blubber. My dusky wife was a source of strife, so I left her in Singapore, and sailed away at the break of day, since then I have widowed four. A vast billet and a lack a day that I gazed in the eyes of beauty, for in devious ways their innocent gaze has caused me much extra duty. I never get past the jolly old mast, the skipper and I are quite chummy. He knows me by sight when I'm sober or tight, and calls me a wicked old rummy. The sort of sweetheart in every port type I intended to make him, a seafaring man of the old school, such as I suppose some of the six stripers around here were. I don't imagine it was very difficult to get a good conduct record in the old days, because of all the tales I've heard from this source and that, a sailor man who did not too openly boast of being a bigamist, and who limited his homicidal inclinations to half a dozen foreigners when on shore leave, was considered a highly respectable character. Perhaps this is not at all true, and I for one can hardly believe it, when I took the virtuous and impeccable exteriors of the few remaining representatives with whom I have come into contact. However, anyone has my permission to ask them if it is true or not, should they care to find out for themselves. I refuse to be held responsible, though. I think I shall send this poem to the paper soon. It must be wonderful to get your poems in print. All my friends will be so proud to know me. I wonder if the editors are well-disposed, God-fearing men. From all I hear, they must be a hard lot. Probably they'll be nice to me because of my connections. I know so many bartenders. Next week I rate Liberty. Ah, little book, I wonder what these pages will contain when I come back. I hate to think. New York, you know, is such an interesting place. March 25th Man, man, how I suffer. I'm so weary I could sleep on my company commander's breast, and to bring oneself to that one must be considerably fatigued, so to speak. Who invented liberty anyway? It's a greatly overrated pastime as far as I can make out, consisting of coming and going with the middle part omitted. One man whispered to me at muster this morning that all he could remember of his liberty was checking out and checking in. He looked unwell. My old pal, Spike Kelly, I hear was also out of luck. His girl was the skipper of a 14th Street Crosstown car so he was forced to spend most of his time riding between the two rivers. He nickled himself to death in doing it. He said if Mr. Shantz plays golf, as no doubt he does, he has Spike Kelly to thank for a nice new box of golf balls. And while on the subject, Spike observes that one of those engaging car signs should read, Is it gallantry, or the advent of woman's suffrage, or the presence of the conductorate that causes so many sailors to wear out their seats riding back and forth, and so many unnecessary fares to be rung up in so doing. His conversation with Mame, his lighter love, was conducted along this line. Say, Mame. Yes, George, dear. Oh, please, madam. What does Tweetums want? You look swell in your new uniform. Oh, Georgie, do you think it fits? Yes, madam, positively. The car was brushed this morning. Your baby will be perfectly safe inside. Mame. George, step forward, please. Go on, dear. Mame, it's doggone hard to talk to you here. Isn't it just... What is it, lady? Cabbage? Oh, baggage. No, no, you can't check baggage here. This isn't a regular train. George, stop holding my hand. I can't make change. Oh, ma'am, who do you love? Why, Tweetums, I love. Plenty of room up forward. Don't jam up the door. You, of course. Fair, please, fair, please. Have your change ready. Can't we get a moment alone, ma'am? Yes, dear. Wait until 
and we'll drive to the car barn then. Transfers! Transfers! Spike says that his liberty was his first actual touch with the horrors of war. Another bird that lived in some remote corner of New York State told me in pitiful tones that all he had time to do was to walk down the street of his hometown, shake hands with the postmaster, lean over the fence and kiss his girl. It had to go two ways, hello and goodbye. Take a package of clean underwear from his mother as he passed by and catch the outbound train on the dead run. All he could do was to wave to the seven other inhabitants. He thought the Grand Central Terminal was a swell dump, though. He said, there's quite a lot of it, which is true. As for myself, I think it best to pass lightly over most of the incidents of my own personal liberty. The best part of a diary is that one can show up one's friends to the exclusion of one's self. Anyway, why put down the happenings of the past 43 hours? They are indelibly stamped on my memory. One sight I vividly recall, Ardy Muggins, the multi-son of Muggins, who plays the automatic clothes wrangler. He was sitting in a full-blooded roadster in front of the Biltmore, and the dear boy was dressed this wise. Ardy is a sailor too, I forgot to mention. There was a white hat on his head. Covering and completely obliterating his Liberty Blues was a huge bearskin coat, which when pulled up disclosed his leggings neatly strapped over patent leather dancing pumps. It was an astounding sight, one that filled me with profound emotion. Aren't you a trifle out of uniform, Ardy? I asked him. One has to be so delicate with Ardy. He's that sensitive. Why, I thought I might as well embellish myself a bit, says Ardy. You've done all of that, says I, but for heaven's sake, dear, do keep away from 14th Street. There are numerous seagoing sailors down there who might embellish you still further. My God, cries Ardy, striving to crush the wind out of the horn. I never slum. Don't, says I, passing inside to shake hands with several of my friends behind the mahogany. Shake hands, alas, was all I did. March 26th. I must speak about the examinations before I forget it. What a clubby time we had of it. I got in a trifle wrong at the start on account of my sociable nature. You know, I thought it was sort of a farewell reception given by the officer and the CPOs to the men departing after their 21 days in probation. So the first thing I did when I went in was to shake hands with an ensign, who I thought was receiving. He got rid of my hand with the same briskness that one removes a live call from one's person. The whole proceeding struck me as being a sort of charity bazaar. People were wandering around from booth to booth in a pleasant, sociable manner, passing a word here and sitting down there in the easiest going way imaginable. Leaving the ensign rather abruptly, I attached myself to the throng and started in a search of ice cream and cake. This brought me up at the table where there was a very pleasant-looking CPO holding sway, and with him, I thought, I would hold a few words. What was my horror on hearing him snap out in a very crusty manner? How often do you change your socks? This is a question I allow no man to ask me, it is particularly objectionable. Why, sir, I replied, don't you think you are slightly overstepping the bounds of good taste? One does not even jest about such totally personal matters, you know. Then rising, I was about to walk away without even waiting for his reply, but he called me back and handed me my paper, on which he had written, Impossible, and underlined it. The next booth I visited seemed to be a little more hospitable, so I sat down with the rest of the fellows and prepared to talk of the events of the past 21 days. How many articles are there? suddenly asked a CPO, who hitherto had escaped my attention. Twelve, I replied promptly, thinking I might just as well play the game too. What are they based on? he almost hissed, but not quite. The Constitution of the United States, I cried in a loud, public-spirited voice, at which the CPO choked and turned dangerously red. 
it seems that not only was I not quite right, but that I couldn't have been more wrong. Go, he gasped, before I do you some injury. A very peculiar man, I thought, but nevertheless, his heart seemed so set on my going that I thought it would be best for us to part. I'm sure I do not wish to force myself upon you, I said icily as I left. The poor man appeared to be on the verge of having a fit. "'Do you want to tie some knots?' asked a kindly voice P.O. at the next booth. "'Crazy about it,' says I, easy like. "'Then tie some,' says he. So I tied a very pretty little knot I had learned at the kindergarten some years ago and showed it to him. "'What's that?' says he. "'That,' replies I coyly. "'Why?' That is simply a true lover's knot. Do you like it? Orderly, he screamed, orderly, remove this. And hands were laid upon me, and I was hurled into the arms of a small, but ever so seagoing appearing chap, who was engaged in balancing his hat on the bridge of his nose and wigwagging at the same time. After beating me over the head several times with the flags, he said I could play with him, and he began to send me messages with lightning-like rapidity. "'What is it?' he asked. "'Really,' I replied, "'I lost interest in your message before you finished. "'After this my paper looked like a million dollars "'with one knocked off. "'What's a hackam attack?' asked the next guy. "'Thinking he was either kidding me "'or giving to using baby talk,' I replied. "'Why, it's a mixture between a thingy-mabob and a niblick. His treatment of me after this answer so unnerved me that I dropped my gun at the next booth and became completely demoralised. The greatest disappointment awaited me at monkey drill, or setting up exercises, however. I thought I was going to kill this, I felt sure I was going to outstrip all competitors, but in the middle of it all the examiner yelled out in one of those sarcastic voices that all rookies learn to fear, Are you trying to flirt with me, or do you think you're a blooming angel? This so sickened me at heart that I left the place without further ado, whatever that might be. Pink teas in the navy are not unmixed virtues. End of part two. Part three of Biltmore Oswald, The Diary of a Hapless Recruit by J. Thorne Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nigel Boydell. Part 3 March 27th, my birthday, and oh how I do miss my cake. It's the first birthday I ever had without a cake, except two, and then I had a bottle. Oh how well I remember my last party, birthday party. There was father and the cake all lit up in the centre of the table. I mean the cake, not father, of course. And there was Gladys. I always called her Glad. She'd been coming to my birthday parties for years and years. She always came first and left last and ate the most and got the sickest of all the girls I knew. It was appalling how that girl could eat. But as I was saying, there was father and the cake and there was mother and glad, and all the little candles were twinkling, lighting up my presents clustered around, among them being half a dozen maroon silk socks, a box of striped neckties, all perfect joys, spats, a lounging gown, ever so many gloves, and the snappiest little cane in all the world. And what have I around me now? A swab on one side, a bucket on the other, a broom draped over my shoulder, CPOs in front of me, POs behind me, and work all around me. Oh, what a hell of a birthday! I told my company commander last night that the next day was going to be my birthday, hoping he would do the handsome thing and let me sleep a little later in the morning, but did he? No, the brute! He said I should get up earlier so as to enjoy it longer. As far as I can find out, the camp remains totally unmoved by the fact that I am one year older today, and what a hubbub they used to raise at home. 
I think the very least they could do up here would be to ask me to eat with the officers. March 28th. These new barracks over in the main camp are too large. Not nearly so nice as our cosy little bays. I'm really homesick for probation and the sound of our company commander's dulcet voice. I met Eli on the street today and I almost broke down on his neck and cried. He was the first familiar thing I had seen since I came over to the main camp. March 29th This place is just like the probation camp, only more so. Life is one continual lecture trimmed with drills and hikes. Oh, when will I ever be an ensign with a cute little submarine chaser all of my own? April 6th The events of the past few days have so unnerved me that I have fallen behind in my diary. I must try to catch up. For what would posterity do should the record of my inspiring career in the service not be faithfully recorded for them to read with reverence and amazements in days to come? One of the unfortunate events arose from scraping a too intimate acquaintance with that horrid old push-ball. How did it ever get into camp anyway? And who ever heard of a ball being so large? It doesn't seem somehow right to me, out of taste if you get what I mean. There is a certain lack of restraint and conservatism about it which all games played among gentlemen most positively should possess. But the chap who pushed that great big beast of a push-ball violently upon my unsuspecting nose was certainly no gentleman. Golly, what a resounding whack! This fellow, I suspect him of being a German spy, basing my suspicions upon his seeming disposition for atrocities, was standing by, looking morosely at this small-sized planet when I blows gently up and says playfully in my most engaging voice, I say, old dear, you push it to me, and I'll push it to you. Softly, though, chappy, softly. And with that, he flung himself upon the ball and hurled it full upon my nose, completely demolishing it. Now, I have always been a little partial to my nose. My eyes, I'll admit, are not quite as soulful as those liquid orbs of Francis X. Bushman's, but my nose has been frequently admired and envied in the best drawing rooms in New York. But it won't be envied any more, I fear. Pitied, rather. Of course, I played the game no more. I was nauseated by pain and the sight of blood. My would-be assassin was actually forced to sit down. He was so weak from brutal laughter. I wonder if I can ever be an ensign with a nose like this. April 7th On the way back from a little outing the other day, my companion Tim, who in civil life has been a barkeep and a good one at that, ingratiated himself in the good graces of a passing automobile party, and we consequently were asked in. There were two girls, sisters I fancy, and a father and mother aboard. And where do you come from, young gentleman? asked the old man. My pal comes from San Diego, pipes up my unscrupulous friend, and my hometown is San Francisco. I knew for a fact that he had never been farther from home than the polo ground, and as for me, I had only the sketchiest idea of where my hometown was supposed to be. Ah, Westerners, exclaimed the old lady. I come from the West myself. My family goes back there every year. Yes, chimed the girls. We just love San Diego. In what section of the town did you live? asked the gentleman. And my friend, whom I was inwardly cursing, seeing my perplexity, quickly put in for me. Oh, you would never know it, sir. And then lowering his voice in a confidential way, he added, He kept a bar room in the Mexican part of the town. A bar room? exclaimed the old lady. Fancy that! She looked at me with great, innocent interest. Yes, continued this lost soul. My father, who is a state senator, sent him to boarding school and tried to do everything for him, but he drifted back into the old life just as soon as he could. It gets a hold on them, you know. 
Yes, I know, said the old lady sadly. My cook had a son that went the same way. He isn't really vicious, though, added my false friend with feigned loyalty. Merely reckless. Well, my poor boy, put in the old gentleman with cheery consideration, I am sure you must find that navy life does you a world of good. Regular hours, temperate living and all that. Right you are, sport, says I bitterly, assuming my enforced role. I haven't slit a greaser's throat since I enlisted. We must all make sacrifices these days, sighed the old lady. And perhaps you will be able to exercise your, uh, uh, rather robust inclinations on the Germans when you meet them on the high seas, remarked the old man, who evidently thought to comfort me. If I can only keep him out of the brig, said this low-down friend of mine, I think they might make a first-rate mess hand out of him. At which remark, both of the girls, who up to this moment had been studying me silently, exploded into loud peals of mirth, and then I knew where I had met them before, at Kitty Van Tassel's coming-out party, and I distinctly recalled having spilled some punch on the pretty one's white satin slipper. "'We get out here,' I said, hoarsely choking with rage. "'But,' exclaimed the old lady, "'it's the loneliest part of the road.' "'However that may be,' I replied with fine firmness, "'I must nevertheless alight here.' I have a great many things to do before I return to camp, and lonely roads are well suited to my purposes. My homicidal leanings are completely overpowering me. Watch him closely, said the old lady to my companion as the car came to a stop. He will have to, I replied grimly as I prepared to alight. Perhaps Mr. Oswald will mix us a cocktail some day, said one of the sisters leaning over the side of the car. I have heard that he supported many bars at one time, but I never knew he really owned one. What? I heard the old lady exclaiming as the car pulled away. He really isn't a bartender at all. Well, fancy that. There were a couple of pairs of rather dusty Liberty Blues in camp that night. April 8th. Yesterday, Mother paid a visit to camp and insisted upon me breaking out my hammock in order for her to see if I had covers enough. "'I can never permit you to sleep in that, my dear,' she said after pounding and prodding it for a few numbers. "'Never. And I'm sure the commander will agree with me after I have explained to him how delicate you have been.' Later in the afternoon she became a trifle mollified when I told her that the master-at-arms came round every night and distributed extra blankets to everyone that felt cold. "'Be sure to see that he gives you enough coverings,' she said severely, "'or else put him on report, which I faithfully promised to do.' She was greatly delighted with the YMCA and the hostess committee. Here I stood her up for several bricks of ice cream and a large quantity of cake. My fourth attempt she refused, however, saying by way of explanation to a very pretty girl standing by, "'It wouldn't be good for him, my dear. "'My son has always had such a weak stomach. "'The least thing upsets him.' "'I believe you,' replied the young lady sympathetically as she gazed at me. "'I certainly looked upset at the moment. "'This was worse than the underwear. "'So that's an ensign,' she exclaimed later in an obviously disappointed tone of voice. "'Well, I'm not sure that I want you to become one now.' The passing ensign couldn't help but hear her, as she had practically screamed in his ear. He turned and studied my face carefully. I think he was making sure that he could remember it. "'Now take me to your physician,' commanded Mother resolutely. "'I want to be sure that he sees that you take your spring tonic regularly.' "'Mother,' I pleaded, "'don't you think it's time you were going? I have a private lesson in sale embroidery in ten minutes,' that I wouldn't miss for the world. The sweetest man teaches it. Well, under the circumstances, I won't keep you, said Mother, but I'll write to the doctor just the same. Yes, do, I urged. Send it care of me, so that he'll be sure to get it. Mother is not a restful creature in camp. 
April 9th. Say there, you with the nose, cried my P.O. company commander today. Are you with us, or are you playing a little game of your own? I wasn't so very wrong, just a slight difference between port and present arms. With you, heart and soul, I replied, hoping to make a favourable impression by a smart retort. That don't work in the manual, he replied. Use your brains and ears. Unnecessarily rough he was, for I don't know but what he wasn't right. April 10th I hear that I am going to be put on the mess crew. God pity me, poor wretch. How shall I ever keep my arms from becoming red? What a terrible war it is. April 11th Saw a basketball game the other night. Never knew it was so rough. I used to play it with the girls and we had such sport. There seemed to be some reason for it then. There are a couple of queer-looking brothers on our team who seem to try utterly to demolish their opponents. They remind me of a couple of tough gentlemen from Scranton I heard about in a story once. April 12th. The price of fags. Gee, I'm getting rough. Has gone up again. This war is rapidly cramping my style. April 14th. I have been too sick at heart to write up my diary. Eli is dead. Pop, the Jimmy Legs, found the body and has been promoted to chief master at arms. It's an ill wind that blows no good. I don't know whether it's because he found Eli or because he runs one of the most modernly managed mess halls in camp or because his working parties are always well attended that Pop received his appointment. But whatever it was, it does my heart good to see a real sea-going old salt, one of our few remaining ex-apprentice boys, receiving recognition that is so well merited. However, I was on much more intimate terms with Eli when I was over in probation camp than I was with Pop. He almost had me in his clutches once for late hammocks, me and eight other poor victims I had led into trouble. And he had our wheelbarrows all picked out for us, and a nice large pile of sand for us to play with when fate interceded on our behalf. The poor man nearly cried out of sheer anguish of soul, and I can't justly blame him. It's hard lines to have a nice, fat, extra duty party go dead on your hands. But with Eli it was different. When I was a homeless rookie, he took me in and I fed him, cigarette butts, and I honestly say that he showed more genuine appreciation than many a flapper I applied with costly viands. He was a good goat, Eli. Not a refined goat, to be sure, but a good, honest, whole-souled goat just the same. He did his share in policing the grounds, never shook a cigar end or a bit of paper, and amused many a mess gear line. He was loyal to his friends, tolerant with new recruits, and a credit to the service in general. Considering the environment in which he lived, I think he deported himself with much dignity and moderation. I for one shall miss Eli. Some of the happier memories of my rookie days die with him. He is survived by numerous dogs. April 25th Yesterday I wandered around probation camp in a very patronising manner and finally stopped to shed a tear on the humble grave of Eli. Who a sinful goat, I thought sadly. Here you lie at last in your final resting place. But your phantom, I wonder, does it go coursing madly down the Milky Way, butting the stars aside with its battle-scarred head, and sending swift gleams of light through the heavens as its hoofs strike against the upturned planet. Your horns, are they tipped with fire and your beard gloriously aflame? Or has the great evil spirit of wayward goats descended upon you and borne you away to a place where there is never anything to but save unsatisfactorily yielding walls of padded cotton? Many changes have taken place, Eli, since you were with us. Much adversity has befallen me, but the world in the large is very much the same. Bill and Mike have been shipped to sea, and strange enough to say, old Spike Kelly has made the quartermaster's school. 
I alone of all the gang remain unspoken for. Nobody seems anxious to avail themselves of my services. My tapes are dirtier, and my white hat grows less sea-going every day. And even you, Eli, are being forgotten. The company commander still carols sweetly in the morning about barrackses and fire distinguishers. Rookies still continue to rook about the camp in their timid, mild-eyed way, while weak old sailors with unwashed leggings delight their simple souls with cries of, Twenty-one days! New goats have been sprung up to take your place in the life of the camp and belittle your past achievements, but to me, O oh, unregenerate goat, you shall ever remain a refreshing memory. Good butting, O oh excellent ruminant, wherever thou should chance to be, I salute you. This soliloquy brought me to the verge of an emotional breakdown. I departed the spot in silence. On my way back through probation, I chanced upon a group of rookies studying for their examinations and was surprised to remember how much I had contrived to forget. Nevertheless, I stopped one of the students and asked him what a hackamaback was and found to my relief that he didn't know. Back to your manual, I said gloomily. I fear you will never be a sailor. Having thus made heavy the heart of another, I continued on my way feeling somehow greatly cheered, only to find upon entering my barracks that my blankets were in the lucky bag. How did I ever forget to place them in my hammock? It was a natural omission, though, I fancy, for the master at arms so terrifies me in the morning with his great shouts of, Hit the deck, sailor! Shake a leg! Rise and shine! that I am unnerved for the remainder of the day. April 29th Life seems to be composed of just one parade after another. I am weary of the plaudits and acclamation of the multitude and long for some sequestered spot on a mountain peak in Tibet. Every time I see a street, I instinctively start to walk down the middle of it. Last week I was one of the many thousands of Pelham men who marched along Fifth Avenue in the Liberty Lawn Parade. I thought I was doing particularly well and would have made a perfect score if one of my leggings hadn't come off right in front of the reviewing stand, much to the annoyance of the guy behind me because he tripped on it and almost dropped his gun. For the remainder of the parade I was subjected to a running fire of abuse that fairly made my flesh crawl. At the end of the march I ran into a rather nebulous middle-aged sort of a gentleman soldier who was sitting on the curb looking moodily at a manhole as if he would like to jump in it. "'Hello, stranger,' says I in a blustery seafaring voice. "'You look as if you've been cursed about as much as I have. "'What sort of an outfit do you belong to?' He scrutinised one of his buttons with great care and then told me all about himself. I'm a home guard, you know, he added bitterly. All we do is to escort people. I've escorted the Blue Devils, the Poilers, the Australians, mothers of enlisted men, mothers of men who would have enlisted if they could, Boy Scouts and loan workers, until my dogs are jolly well near broken down on me. Golly, I wish I was young enough to enjoy a quiet night's sleep in the trenches for a change. Later, I saw him gloomily surveying the world from the window of a passing cab. He was evidently through, for the time being at least. End of Part 3「Part 4 of Biltmore Oswald, The Diary of a Hapless Recruit by J. Thorne Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nigel Boydell Part 4 April 30th I took my barkeeping pal home over the last weekend liberty. It was a mistake. He admits it himself. Mother will never have him in the house again. Mother could never get him in the house again. He fears her. The first thing he did was to mix poor dear grandfather a drink that caused the old gentleman to forget his game leg, which had been damaged in battles ranging anywhere from the Mexican to the Spanish Wars, 
according to grandfather's mood at the time he is telling the story, but which I believe, according to a private theory of mine, was really caught in a folding bed. However it was, grandfather forgot all about this leg of his entirely and insisted on dancing with Nora, our new maid. Mother, of course, was horrified. But not content with that, this friend of mine concocted some strange beverage for the pater, which so delighted him that he loaned my so-called pal the ten spot I had been intending to borrow. The three of them sat up until all hours of the night playing cards and telling ribald stories. As mother took me upstairs to bed, she gazed down on her father-in-law and her husband in the clutches of this demon and remarked bitterly to me, like father, like son, and I knew that she was thoroughly determined to make both of them pay dearly for their pleasant interlude. Breakfast the next morning was a rather trying ordeal. Grandfather once more resorted to his game leg with renewed vigour, referring several times to the defence of the Alamo, so I knew he was pretty low in his mind. Father withdrew at the sight of bacon, Mother laughed scornfully as he departed. My friend ate a hearty breakfast and kept a sort of happy-go-lucky monologue throughout its entire course. I took him out walking afterwards and forgot to bring him back. April 31st Have just come off guard duty and feel quite exhausted. The guns are altogether too heavy. I can think of about five different things I could remove from them without greatly decreasing their utility. The first would be the barrel. The artist who drew the picture in the last camp paper of Dawn appearing in the form of a beautiful woman must have had more luck than I've ever had. I think he would have been closer to the truth if he had put her in a speeding automobile on its way home from a roadhouse. It surely is a proof of discipline to hear the mocking, silver-toned laughter of women ringing out in the night only ten feet away and not drop your gun and follow it right through the barbed wire. After the war, I'm going to buy a lot of barbed wire and cut it up into little bits just to relieve my feelings. Last night I had the fright of my life. Someone was fooling around the fence in the darkness. Who's there? I cried. Why, I'm Kaiser William, came the answer in a subdued voice. Well, I wish you'd go away, Kaiser William, said I nervously. You're busting the lights out of rule number six. What's that? asked the voice. Not to commit a nuisance with anyone except in a military manner, I replied, becoming slightly involved. That's not such a wonderful rule, came back the voice in complaining tones. I couldn't make up a rule better than that. Don't try tonight, I pleaded. There was silence for a moment, then the voice continued seriously. Say, I'm not Kaiser William, really. Honest, I'm not. Well, who are you? I asked impatiently. Why, I'm Tux, the voice replied. Folks call me that because I take so many of them in my trousers. Well, Tux, I replied, you'd better be moving on. I don't know what might happen with this gun. I'm tempted to shoot the cartridge out of it just to make it lighter. Oh, you can't shoot me, cried Tux. I'm crazy. I bet you didn't know that, did you? I wasn't sure, I answered. Oh, I'm awfully crazy, continued Tux. Everybody says so. And I look it in the daylight. You must, I replied. Well, good night, said Tux in the same subdued voice. If you find a flock of pink Liberty Bonds around here, remember I lost them. He departed in the direction of City Island. May 1st I visited the office of the camp paper today and found it to be an extremely hectic place. In the course of a conversation with the chief, I chanced to look up and caught two shining eyes staring malevolently at me from a darkened corner of the room. This creature blinked at me several times very rapidly, wiggled its moustache, and suddenly disappeared into the thick shadows. "'Who is that?' I cried, startled. "'That's our mad photographer,' said the chief. "'What do you think of him?' 
Do you keep him in there? I asked, pointing to the cold, black, cupboard-like room into which this strange creature had disappeared. Yes, said the chief, and he likes it. Often he stays there for days at a time, only coming out for air. At this juncture there came from the dark room the sounds of breaking glass, which was immediately followed by strange, animal-like sounds as the mad photographer burst out of his den and proclaimed to all the world that nothing meant very much in life and that it would be absolutely immaterial to him if the paper and its entire staff should suddenly be visited with flood, fire and famine. After this gracious and purely gratuitous piece of information, he again withdrew. But strange mutterings still continued to issue forth from his lair. While I was sitting in the office, the editor happened to drift in from an adjacent room, crisply attired in a pair of ragged, disreputable trousers and a sleeveless grey sweater, which was ravelling in numerous places. It was the shock of my life. "'Where's our yeoman?' he grumbled, at which the yeoman, who somehow reminded me of some character from one of Dickens' novels, edged out of the door, but he was too late. Spying him, the editor launched forth on a violent denunciation, in which, for no particular reason, the cartoonist and sporting editor joined. There they stood, the three of them, abusing this poor, simple yeoman in the most unnecessary manner, as far as I could make out. Three harder cutthroats I have never encountered. While in the office I came upon a rather elderly artist crouched over in a corner, writhing as if he were in great pain. He was in the throes of composition, I was told, and he looked it. Poor wretch, he seemed to have something on his mind. The only man I saw who seemed to have anything like a balanced mind was the financial shark, a little ferret-eyed, honorary-looking cuss whom I wouldn't have trusted out of my sight. He was sitting with his nose thrust in some dusty volume, totally oblivious of the pandemonium that reigned around him. He either has a great mind or none at all, probably the latter. I fear I would never make an editor. The atmosphere is simply altogether too strenuous for me. May 4th there seems to be no place in the service for me. I cannot decide what rating to select. To be a quartermaster one must know how to signal, and signalling always tires my arms. One must know how to blow a horrid shrill little whistle in order to come a boatswain mate, and my ears could never stand this. To be a yeoman it is necessary to know how to rattle papers in an important manner, and to disseminate misinformation with a straight face, and this I could never do. I fear the only thing left for me is to try for a commission. I am sure I would be a valuable addition to any wardroom. May 6th Man the drags! Hey there, you flannel-footed camel! Stop galloping! What are you doing anyway? Playing horses? Don't be ridiculous, I cried out, hot with rage and humiliation. You know perfectly well I am not playing horse. I realise as well as you do that this is a serious, at this juncture of my brave retort, a gun barrel stove in the back of my head. Someone kicked me on the shin, and in some indescribable manner the butt of a rifle became tangled between my feet, and down I went in a cloud of dust and oaths. One fourth of the entire Pelham field artillery passed over my body, together with its crew while through the roar and confusion raised by this horrible cataclysm, I could hear innumerable CPOs howling and blackguarding me in a frenzied tones, and I dimly distinguished their forms dancing in rage amid descending bellows of dust. The parade ground swirled dizzily around me, but I had no desire to arise and begin life anew. It would not be worth while. I felt I had at most a short time to live, and that was too long. The world offered nothing but the most horrifying possibilities to me. What is the Biltmore to a man in uniform anyway? I remember thinking to myself as I lay there with my nose pressed flat to an anthill. All the best parts of it are arid districts, waste places, limitless Saharas to him. Death, where is thy sting? I continued as an outraged ant assaulted my nose. The world came throbbing back. 
I felt myself being dragged violently away from my resting place. I was choking. Bidding farewell to the ants, I preferred myself to swoon when gradually, as if from a great distance, I heard the voice of my P.O. He was almost crying. Take him out, he pleaded. For God's sake, take him out. He's hurting our gun. This remark gave me the strength to rise, but not gracefully. My intention was to address a few hand-pit words to this P.O. of mine, but fortunately for my future peace of mind, I was beyond utterance. Weakly I tottered in the direction of the gun, hoping to support myself upon it. "'Hey, come away from that gun!' howled the P.O. "'Don't let him touch it, fellas,' he pleaded. "'Don't let him go near it. He'll spoil it. He'll completely destroy it!' "'Say, buddy,' said the chief to me, and how I hated the ignominy of the word. I guess I'll take you out of the game for today. I am responsible for government property, and you are altogether too big a risk. What shall I do? I asked huskily. Where shall I go? Do, he repeated in a thoughtful voice. Go? Well, here's where you can go, he told me, and this is what you can do when you get there, and as I departed rather hastily, he told me this also. The entire parade ground heard him. How shall I ever be able to hold up my head again in camp? I departed the spot, but only under one boiler. However, I made fair speed. Like a soldier returning from a week in the trenches, I sought the comfort and seclusion of the YMCA. Here I witnessed a checker contest of a low order between two unscrupulous brothers. They had a particular technique completely their own. It consisted of arts and dodges and an extravagant use of those adjectives one is commonly supposed to shun. Say there's a queen down the end of the room, one of them was suddenly exclaim, and while the other brother was gazing eagerly in that direction, he would deliberately remove several of his men from the board. But the other brother, who was not so balm as he looked, would occasionally discover this slight irregularity and proceed to express his opinion of it by word of mouth, which, for sheer force of expression, was in the nature of a revelation to me. It was appalling to sit there and watch those two young men, who had evidently at one time come from a good home, sit in God's bright sunshine and cheat each other throughout the course of the afternoon and lie out of it in the most obvious manner. The game was finally discontinued, owing to a shortage of checkermen, which they had secreted in their pockets, a fact which each stoutly denied with many weird and rather indelicate vows. I left them engaged in the pleasant game of recrimination, which had to do with stolen golf balls, the holding out of change, and kindred sort of subjects. In my weakened condition, this display of fraternal depravity so offended my instinctive sense of honour that I was forced to retire behind the protective pages of a 1913 issue of The Farmer's Wife Indispensable Companion, where I managed to lose myself for the time being in a rather complicated exposition of how to tell which chicken laid what egg, if any or something to that effect, an article that utterly demolished the moral character of the average hen, leaving her hardly a leg to roost on. May 8th. Give away, said the coxswain today, when we were struggling to get our cutter off the pier, and I gave away to such an extent, in fact, that I suddenly became myself balanced cleverly on the back of my neck in the bottom of the boat, so that I experienced the rather odd sensation of feeling the hot sun on the soles of my feet. This procedure, of course, did not go unnoticed. Nothing I do goes unnoticed, save the good things. The coxswain made a few comments which showed him to be a thoroughly ill-bred person. But further than this, I was not persecuted. After we had rode interminable distances through league upon league of doggedly resisting water, a man in the bow remarked casually that he had several friends in Florida we might call upon if we kept it up a little longer. But the coxswain, comfortably ensconced upon the hackamatack, was so deeply engrossed in the perusal of a vest pocket edition of The Merchant of Venice that he failed to grasp the full meaning of the remark. I lifted my rapidly glazing eyes with no little effect 
from the keelson and discovered to my horror that we had hardly passed more than half a mile of shoreline at the most. What we had been doing all the time I was unable to figure out. I thought we'd been rowing. I could have sworn we'd been rowing, but apparently we'd not. I looked up from my meditation in time to catch the ironical gaze of the coxswain upon me, and I involuntarily braced myself to the assault. "'Say there, sailor,' said he, with a slow, unpleasant drawl. "'You're not rowing. You're weaving. It's fancy work you're doing. Blast your eyes!' All who was sufficient strength left in them laughed jeeringly at this wise observation, but I retained a dignified silence, that is, so far as a man panting from exhaustion can be silent. At this moment we passed a small boat being rowed briskly along by a not unattractive girl. "'Now watch her,' said the coxswain helpfully to me. "'Study the way that poor fragile girl, that mere child, pulls the oars.' and try to do likewise. I observed in shamed silence. My hands ached. A motorboat slid swiftly by, and I distinctly saw a man drinking beer from a bottle. Hell isn't dark and smoky, thought I to myself. Hell is bright and sunny, and there is a lot of sparkling water in it, and on the sparkling water are innumerable boats, and in these boats are huddled the poor, lost mortals who are forced to listen through eternity to the wise cracks of a cloven-hooved, spark-tailed coxswain. That's what hell is, thought I, and I'm in my probation period right now. Feather your oars! suddenly screamed our master at the straining crew. Feather me eye! yelled back a courageous Irishman. What do you think these oars are anyway, a flock of owing birds? Who ever heard of feather in a hundred ton weight? Feather Pike's Peak, say I, it's just as easy. Somehow we got back to the pier, but I was almost delirious by this time. The last part of the trip was all one drab, dull nightmare to me. This evening my hands were so swollen I was forced to the extremity of bribing a friend to hold the telephone receiver for me when I called up Mother. "'What have you been doing?' she asked. "'Rowing,' came my short answer. "'What a splendid outing!' she exclaimed. "'You had such a lovely day for it, didn't you, dear?' "'Hang up that receiver!' I shouted to my friend. "'Hang it up, or my mother shall hear from the lips of her son "'words she shall only hear from her husband.' "'May 9th. "'I am just after having been killed in a sham battle.' and so consequently I feel rather ghastly today. I don't exactly know whether I was a red or a blue, because I did a great deal of fighting on both sides, but always with the same result. I was killed instantly and completely. People got sick of putting me out of my misery after a while, and I was allowed to wander around at large in a state of great mystification and excitement, shooting my blank bullets into the face of nature in an aimless sort of manner whenever the battle began to pall upon me. Most of the time I passed pleasantly on the soft, fresh flank of a hill where for a while I slept until a cow breathed heavily in my face and reminded me that it was war after all. My instructions were to keep away from the guns and get killed as soon as possible. As these instructions were not difficult to follow, I carried them out to the letter. I stayed away from the guns, and I permitted myself to be killed several times in order to make sure it would take. After that I became a sort of composite camp follower, deserter, and straggler. In my wandering I chanced upon an ancient enemy of many past encounters. "'Are you red or blue?' I asked, preparing to die for the fifth time. No, he answers sarcastically, I'm what you might call elephant ear grey. Are you the guy the reporter for the camp paper was referring to in his last story? I asked him. Yes, he replied, the slandering blackguard. You hit me on the nose with a push ball, said I. I'll do it again, said he. That reporter, 
evidently a man of some observation, said you didn't wash your neck, and that you had the habits of a camel. But I do wash my neck, he said stubbornly, and I don't know anything about the habits of a camel, but whatever they might happen to be, I haven't got em. Yes, I replied, as if to myself, you certainly should wash your neck. That's the very least you could do. But I tell you, he cried desperately, I keep telling you that I do wash my neck. Why do you go on talking about it as if I didn't? I tell you now, once for all time, that I do wash my neck, and that ends it. Don't talk any more. I want to think. We sat in silence for a space. Then I remarked casually, almost inaudibly, and you certainly shouldn't have the habits of a camel. The depraved creature stirred uneasily. I ain't got em, he said. Good, I cried heartily. We understand each other perfectly. In the future, you will try to wash your neck and cease from having the habits of a camel. No compromise is necessary. I know you will keep your word. Go away quickly, he gasped, searching around for a stone to hurl at me and discarding several because of their small size. Go away to somewhere else, I'm telling you now. Go away, or else a special detail will find your lifeless body here in the bushes sometime tomorrow. I've already been thoroughly killed several times today, I said, putting a tree between us. But don't forget about the camel, and for heaven's sake, do try to keep your neck. A stone hit the tree with a resounding crack, and I increased the distance. Damn the torpedoes, I shouted back as I disappeared into the pleasant security of the sun-warmed woods. End of part four. Part 5 of Biltmore Oswald, The Diary of a Hapless Recruit by J. Thorne Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nigel Boydell. Part 5 May 11th. What navy do you belong to? asked an ensign stopping me today. The Chinese? Why do you ask, sir? I replied, saluting gracefully. Of course I don't belong to the Chinese Navy. What's your rating? He snapped. Sure, girl. First class, attached to the good ship Biff Bang, sir, came my prompt retort. Well, put a watch mark on your arm, sailor, and put it there pronto, or you'll be needing an understudy to pinch it for you. As a matter of fact, I have never put my watch mark on for the simple reason that I have been rather expecting a rating at any moment. But it seems as if my expectations were doomed to disappointment. Nothing matters much anyway now, however, for I have been selected from among all the men in the station to play the part of a showgirl in the coming magnificent Pelham production, Biff Bang. At last I have found the occupation to which, by training and inclination, I am naturally adapted. The grand moguls that are running this show came around the barracks the other day, looking for material, and when they gazed upon me, I felt sure that their search had not been in vain. "'Why don't you write a nut part for him?' asked one of the playwrights as they surveyed me critically, as if I was some rare specimen of bug life. "'That would never do,' he answered. Real nuts can never play the part on stage. You've got to have a man of intelligence. Look here, I broke in. You've got to stop talking about me before my eyes as if I wasn't really present. Nuts I may be, but I can still understand English, even when badly spoken, and I resent it. Lay off that stuff, or I'll be constrained to introduce you to a new brand of Biff Bang. Saying this, I struck an heroic attitude, but it seemed to produce no startling change in their calm, deliberate examination of me. He'll do, I think, as a showgirl, the dance master mused dreamily. Like a cabbage, every one of his features is bad, but the whole effect is not revolting. Strange, isn't it, how such things happen? At this point, the musician broke in. He ain't a going to dance to my music if I know it. He'll ruin it at which remark I executed a few rather simple but nevertheless neat steps 
I had learned at the last charity bazaar to which I had contributed my services, and these few steps were sufficient to close the deal. I was signed up on the spot. As they were leaving the barracks, one excited young person ran up and halted the arrogant thespians. "'If I get the doctor to remove my Adam's apple,' he pleaded wistfully, "'do you think you could take me on as a pony?' "'No,' said one of them, not without a certain show of kindness. "'I fear not. "'It will be necessary for him to remove the greater part of your map "'and graft a couple of pounds onto your sadly unendowed limbs.' "'From that day on, my life has become one of unremitting toil.' Together with the rest of the showgirls, I vamp and slouch my way around the clock with ever-increasing seductiveness. We are really doing splendidly. The ponies come leaping lightly across the floor, waving their freckled, muscular arms from side to side and looking very unattractive indeed in their BVDs, high shoes and sock supporters. I can see it all, says the director in an enthusiastic voice, and if he can, I'll admit he has some robust quality of imagination that I fail to possess. Us showgirls, of course, have to be a little more modest than the ponies, so we retain our white trousers. These are rolled up, however, in order to afford the mosquitoes, who are covering the show most conscientiously, room to roost on. And sad to relate, the life is beginning to affect the boys. Only yesterday I saw one of our toughest ponies vamping up the aisle of Mess Hall 2 with his tray held over his head in the manner of a Persian slave girl. The Jimmy Legs, witnessing this strange sight, dropped his jaw and forgot to lift it up again. Sweet attire of roses, he muttered. Whatever has happened to our poor, long-suffering navy? At the door of the Mess Hall the pony bowed low to the deck, and withdrew with a coy backward flirt of his foot. I can't express in words the remarkable appearance made by some of our seagoing chorus girls when they attempt to assume the light and airy graces of the real article. Some of the men have so deeply entered into their parts that they have attained absolute self-forgetfulness, with the result that they leap and preen about in a manner quite startling to the dispassionate spectator. My career so far has not been a personal triumph. In the middle of a number the other night, the dancing master clapped his hands violently together, a signal he uses when he wants all motion to cease. Take him down to the end of the room, boys, he said. I can tell three minutes ahead of time when things are going to go wrong. That man on the end didn't have a thought in his head. He would have smeared the entire number. I was the man on the end. May 23rd. This has not been a particularly agreeable day. Although to a woman, no doubt, it would have been laden with moments of exquisite ecstasy. Feminine apparel for me has lost forever the charm of mystery that formerly touched it with enchantment. There is nothing I do not know now. Its innermost secret has been revealed, and its revelation has brought with it its full burden of war. All knowledge is pain, and vice versa. I have always admired women, whether so profoundly as they have admired me, I know not. However that may be, I have always admired them collectively and individually in the past. But after today's experience, my admiration is tinged with pity. The source of these reflections lies in the no less an article than a corset. As a showgirl, it has been my lot to be provided with one of these fiendish devices of medieval days. It is too much. The course it must go. No woman could have experienced the pain and discomfort I have been subjected to this day without feeling entitled to the vote. Yet I dare say these are women who will gladly be poured into a new corset every day of their lives. They can have mine for the asking. Life at its best presents a narrow enough outlook without resorting to cunningly wrought devices such as corsets in order further to confine one's point of view or abdomen, which amounts to the same thing. The whale is a noble animal. It was a very good idea, the whale and I love every bone in its body, so long as it keeps them there. So tightly was my body clutched in the embrace of this vicious contraption 
that I found it impossible to inhale my much-needed cigarette. The smoke would descend no further than my throat. The rest of me was a closed port, a roadway blocked to traffic. I have suffered. But there were also other devices, other soft, seductive understrappings. I know them all to their last, most intimate detail. I feel that now I could join a women's sewing circle and talk with as much authority and wisdom as the most veteran corset were at present. My views would be radical, perhaps, but at least they would have the virtue of being refreshing. However, I can see some good coming out of my unavoidably acquired knowledge of female attire. In future days, while my wife is out purchasing shirts and neckties for me, I can easily employ my time to advantage in shopping around Fifth Avenue in search of the correct thing in lingerie for her. It will be a great help to the household, and I am sure to impress my wife with the depth of range of my education, which I will be able to tell her, thank God, was innocently acquired. May 28th I am slowly forming back into my pristine shape, but only after having been freed from bondage for some hours. After several more sodas, concoctions, which up till recently I have despised as injurious, I guess I will have filled out my usual dimensions around the waistline. But when I consider the long days of womanhood stretched out before me in future, I will admit it is with a sinking not only of the waist, but also of the heart. More indignities have been heaped upon me. Why did I ever take up the profession of a showgirl? Today I fell into the clutches of the barbers. They were not gentle clutches, brutal rather and such an outspoken lot they were at that. "'What's that?' asked one of them, as I stood rather nervously before him with bared chest. "'Why, that,' I replied, a trifle disconcerted. "'That's my chest.' He looked at me for a moment, then smiled a slow, pitiful smile. "'Hey, Tony,' he suddenly called to his colleague, "'come over here a moment to see what this bird claims to be a chest.' All this yelled in the face of the entire Biff Bang Company. It was more inhuman and debasing than my first physical examination in public. The doctors on this occasion, although they had not complimented me, had at least been comparatively impersonal in dispatching their offices, but these men were far from being impersonal. I perceived with horror that it was their intention to use my chest as a means of bringing humour into their drab existences. Tony came and surveyed me critically. That, he drawled musically, is not a chest. That is the bottom part of his neck. I know it is, replied the other, but somehow his arms have got mixed up in the middle of it. Tony shrugged his shoulders eloquently. He assumed the appearance of a man completely baffled. Honestly now, young fellow, continued my first tormentor, are you serious when you tell us that that is your chest? He drew attention to the highly disputed territory by poking me diligently with his thumb. That's the part the doctor always listens to whenever I had a cold, I replied as indifferently as possible. The man pondered over this for a moment. Well, he replied at length, probably the doctor was right, but to the impartial observer it would seem to be, as my friend Tony so accurately observed, the bottom part of your neck. It really doesn't matter much after all, I replied, hoping to close the conversation. You all were not sent here to establish the location of the different parts of my anatomy anyway. The man appeared not to have heard me. I'd swear, he murmured musingly, standing back and regarding me with a tilted head. I swear it was his neck if it weren't for his arms. He suddenly discontinued his dreamy observations and became all business. Well, sir, he began briskly. Now that we've settled that, what do you want me to do to it? Why, shave it, of course, I replied bitterly. That's what you're here for, isn't it? All us showgirls have to have our chest shaved. And after I've shaved your chest, dear, he asked in a soothing voice, what do you want me to do with it? With what? I replied enraged. With my chest? No, he answered easily. Not your chest, but that one poor little pitiful hair that adorns it. Do you want me to send it home to your ma, 
all tied around with a pink ribbon? I saw no reason to reply to this insult, but stood uneasily and tried to maintain my dignity while he lathered me with undue elaboration. When it was time for him to produce his razor, he faltered. I can't do it, he said brokenly. I haven't the art to cut it down in its prime. It looks so lonely and helpless there by itself. He swept his razor around several times with a free-handed, blood-curdling swoop of his arm. Well, here goes, he said, shutting his eyes and approaching me. Tony turned away as if unable to witness the scene. I was unnerved, but I stood my ground. The deed was done, and I was at last free to depart. That's a terrible chest for a showgirl, I heard him say to Tony as I did so. May 29th The world has come clattering down around my ears, and I am buried, crushed and bruised, beneath the debris. There was a dress rehearsal today, and I, from the whole company, was singled out for the wrath of the gods. Who is that chorus girl on the end acting frantic? cried out one of the directors in the middle of a number. My name was shouted across the stage until it echoed and resounded and came bounding back in my face from every corner of the shadow-plunged theatre. I knew I was in for it and drew myself up majestically, although I turned pale under my war paint. Well, tell him he isn't walking on stilts, continued the director, and although it was perfectly unnecessary, I was told that and several other things with brutal candour. The dance went on, but I knew the eyes of the director were on me. My legs seemed to lose all proper coordination. My arms became unmanageable. I lost step and could not pick it up again. Yet, as in a nightmare, I struggled on desperately. Suddenly the director clapped his hands, the music ceased, and I slowed down to an uneasy shuffle. Sweetheart, said the director, addressing me personally, you're not dancing, you're swimming, that's what you're doing. As a Persian girl you would make a first-class squaw. He halted for a moment and then bawled out in a great voice, Understood it! And I was removed from the stage in a fainting condition. This evening I was shipped back to camp, a thoroughly discredited showgirl. I had laboured long in vicious, soul-squelching corsets and like Samson being shorn of my locks, and here I am after all my sacrifices, relegated back to the scrap heap. Why am I always the unfortunate one? I must have a private plot in the sky strewn with unlucky stars. Camp routine after the free life of the stage is unbearably irksome. My particular Jimmy Legs was so glad to see me back that he almost cried as he thrust a broom and a swab into my hands. Bear a hand, he said gleefully. Get to work and stick to it. We're shorter men, he added, and there's no end to the things for you to do. I did them all, and he was right. There surely is no end of things he can devise for me to do. I long for the glamour and footlights of the gay white way. I have been cast out and rejected, as many a showgirl has before me. June the 1st The morning papers say all sorts of nice things about Biff Bang, but I can hardly believe them sincere after the treatment I received. I know for a fact that the man who took my place was not need, and that the rest of his figure could not hold a candle to mine. I still feel convinced that Biff Bang lost one of its most prepossessing and talented artists when I was so unceremoniously removed from the chorus. End of part five. Part six of Piltmore Oswald, The Diary of a Hapless Recruit by J. Thorn Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nigel Boydell. Part six. June 10th. I was standing, doing harm to no one in a vague, rather unfortunate way I have, when all of a sudden, without word or warning, 
a very competent-looking sailor seized me by the shoulders and, thrusting his face close to mine, cried out, "'Do you want to make a name for yourself in the service?' I left the ground two feet below me in my fright, and when I alighted there were tears of eagerness in my eyes. "'Yes,' I replied breathlessly. "'Oh, sir, yes!' "'Then pick up that,' he cried dramatically pointing to a cigar butt on the parade ground. I didn't wait for the laughter. I didn't have to. It was forthcoming immediately. Huge peals of it. Sailors are a very low tribe of vertebrae. They seem to hang around most of the time, waiting for something to laugh at, usually me. It is my belief that I have been the subject of more mirth since I came to camp than any other man on the station. Whatever I do, I seem to do it too much or too little. There even seems to be something mirth-provoking in my personal appearance, which I have always regarded hitherto not without a certain shade of satisfaction. Only the other day I caught the eyes of the gloomiest sailor in camp studying me with a puzzled expression. He gazed at me for such a long time that I became quite disconcerted. Slowly a smile spread across his face, then a strange, rusted laugh forced itself through his lips. Doggone if I can solve it, he chuckled, turning away and shaking his head. It's simply too much for me. He looked back once, clapped his hands over his mouth, and proceeded merrily on his way. I'm glad, of course, to be able to bring joy into the lives of sailors, but I did not enlist for that sole purpose. Returning to the cigar butt, however, I was really quite disappointed. I do so want to make a name for myself in the service that I would eagerly jump at the chance of sailing up the Kyle Canal in a Burnaget sneak box, were it not for the fact that sailing always makes me deathly sick. I don't know why it is but the more I have to do with water, the more reasons I find for shunning it. The cigar butt episode broke my heart, though. I was all keyed up for some heroic deed. What an anticlimax! I left the spot in a bitter, humiliated mood. There is only one comforting part about the whole affair. I did not pick up that cigar butt. He did. I'll bet, though, when nobody was looking... I don't know as I blame him. There were still several healthy drags left in it. June 11th This war is going to put a lot of Chinamen out of business if it keeps up much longer. The first thing a sailor will do after he's been paid off will be to establish a laundry. And he won't be a slouch at the business at that. I feel sure that I am qualified right now to take in family laundry and before the end of summer I guess I'll be able to do fancy work. At present I am what you might call a first class laundryman, but I'm not a fancy laundryman yet. Since they put us in white I go around with the washerwoman's complaint most of the time. Terrible shooting pains in my back. My sympathy for the downtrodden is increasing by leaps and bounds. I can picture myself without any effort of the imagination bending over a tub after the war doing the family washing while my wife is out running for aldermen or pulling the wires to be appointed commissioner of the docks. The white clothes situation, however, is serious. It seems that every spare moment I have I am either washing, or thinking of washing, or just after having washed, and to one who possesses, as I do, the uncanny faculty of being able to get dirtier in more places in the shortest space of time than any ten street children picked at random could ever equal, life presents one long vista of soap and suds. You boys look so cute in your funny white uniforms, a girl said to me the other day. It must be so jolly wearing them. I didn't strike her, for she was easily ten pounds heavier than I was, but I made it easily apparent that our relations would never progress further than the weather vane. 
I used to affect white pyjamas, the same seeming to harmonise with the natural purity of my nature. But after the war, I fear I shall be forced to discontinue the practice in favour of more lurid attire. However, I still believe that a bachelor should never wear anything other than white pyjamas or at the most lavender, but this, of course, is merely a personal opinion. June 14th. I have been hard put today. The Lord only knows what trials and tribulations will be visited upon me next. At present, I am quite unnerved. Today, I was initiated into all the horrifying secrets and possibilities of the bayonet, European style. Never do I remember spending a more unpleasant half an hour. The instructor was a resourceful man, possessed of a most vivid imagination. Before he had finished with us, potential delicatessen dealers were lying around as thick as flies. We were brushing them off. After several hair-raising exhibitions, he formed us into two lines, facing each other, and told us to begin. No lunge, he said, and look as if you meant business. I glanced ingratiatingly across at my adversary. He was simply glaring at me. Never have I seen an expression of greater ferocity. It was too much. I knew for certain that if he ever lunged at me, I'd never live to draw another yellow slip. Mr. Officer, I gasped, pointing across at this bloodthirsty man. Don't you think that he's just a little too close? I'm afraid I might hurt him by accident. The officer surveyed the situation with a swift, practical eye. Oh, I guess he can take care of himself all right, he replied. That was just what I feared. The man smiled grimly. But does he know that this is only practice? I continued. He certainly doesn't look as if he did. That's the way you should look, said the officer. Work your own face up a bit. This isn't a vampire scene. Don't look as if you were going to lure him. You know you're supposed to be angry with your opponent when you meet him in battle. Quite put out, in fact. And furthermore, you're supposed to look it. I regarded my opponent, but only terror was written on my face. Then suddenly... We lunged, and either through fear or mismanagement I succeeded only in running my bayonet deep into the ground. In some strange manner the butt of the gun jabbed me in the stomach, and I was completely winded. My opponent was dancing and darting around me like a local but thoroughgoing lightning storm. I abandoned my gun and stood sideways, thus decreasing the possible area of danger. Had the exercises continued much longer, I would have had a spell of something, probably the blind staggers. You're not pole vaulting, said the instructor to me as he returned the gun. In a real show, you'd have looked like a pincushion by this time. I felt like one. Then it all started over again, and this time I thought I was doing a little better, when quite unexpectedly the instructor shouted at me, Stop prancing around in that silly manner, he cried. You're not doing a sword dance, sonny. He thinks he's still a showgirl, someone chuckled. He's that seductive. Mess gear interrupted our happy morning. The sight of a knife fairly sickened me. June 24th. Last week I caught a liberty, a perfect 43 and went to spend it with some cliff-dwelling friends of mine who, heaven help their wretched lot, lived on the sixth and top floor of one of those famous New York struggle-ups. Before shoving off, there was some slight misunderstanding between the inspecting officer and myself relative to the exact colour of my, broadly speaking, whites. Fall out there, he said to me. You can't go out on liberty in blues. But these, sir, I responded huskily, are not blues, they're whites. Look like blues to me, he said sceptically. Fall out anyway, you're too dirty. 
For the first time in my life, I said nothing at the right time. I just looked at him. There was a dumb misery in my eyes, a mute, humble appeal such as is practised with so much success by dogs. He couldn't resist it. Probably he was thinking of the days when he too stood in line waiting impatiently for the final formalities to be run through before the world was his again. Turn around, he said brokenly. I did so. Fall in, he ordered, after having made a prolonged inspection of my shrinking back. I guess you'll do, but you're only getting through on a technicality. There's one white spot under your collar. Officers are people after all, although sometimes it's hard to realise it. This one, in imagination, I anointed with oil and rare perfumes and costly gifts I laid at his feet, while in a glad voice I called down the blessings of John Paul Jones upon his excellent head. Thus I departed with my kind, and never did the odour of gasoline smell sweeter in my nose than did the fumes that were being emitted by the impatient flavour that waited without the gate. And sweet too was the fetid atmosphere of the subway after the clean, bracing air of Pelham. Sweet was the smell of garlic belonging to a moustache that sat beside me, and sweet were the bustery fingers of a small child who kept clawing at me while their owner demanded of the whole car if I was a wheel maybe sailor boy. I didn't look it, and I didn't feel it, but I had forty-three hours of freedom ahead of me, so what did I care? All went well with me until I essayed the sixth flight climb up to the cave of these cliff-dwelling people, when I found that the one-storied existence I had been leading in the Pelham bungalows had completely unfitted me for mountain climbing. As I toiled upwards, I wondered dimly how these people ever managed to keep so fat after having mounted to such a great distance for so long a time. Somehow they had done it, not only maintained their already acquired fat, but added greatly thereto. There will be no refreshing cup to quaff upon arriving, only water, or at best milk. This I knew, and the knowledge added pounds to my already heavy feet. My, what a dirty sailor you are, to be sure, they said to me from the depths of their plump complacency. Quite so, I gasped, falling into a chair. I seem to remember having heard the same thing once before today. June 25th Neither Saturday nor Sunday was a complete success, and for a while Saturday afternoon assumed the proportions of a disaster. After having rested from my climb, I decided to wash my white so that I wouldn't be arrested as a deserter or be thrown into the brig upon checking in. The fat people, on learning of my intentions, decided that the sight of such labour would tire them beyond endurance, so they departed, leaving me in solitary possession of their flat. I thereupon removed my jumper, humped my back over the tub, scrubbed industriously until the garment was white, then hastened roofwards and arranged it prettily on the line. This accomplished, I hurried down, removed my trousers, re-humped my back over the tub, scrubbed industriously until my trousers in turn were white, and once more dashed roofwards. I have always been absent-minded, but never to such an appalling extent as to appear clad only in my scanty underwear in the midst of a mixed throng of ladies, gentlemen and children. This I did. Some venturous souls had claimed the roof as their own during my absence, so that when I sprang from the final step to claim my place in the sun, I found myself by no means alone. With a cry of horror, I leapt to the other side of the clothesline and endeavoured to conceal myself behind an old lady's petticoat or a lady's old petticoat or something of that nature. Whoever wore the thing must have been a very short person indeed, for the garment reached scarcely down to my knees, below which my BVDs fluttered in an intriguing manner. Sir, 
thundered a pompous gentleman. Have you any explanation for your surprising conduct? Several, I replied briskly from behind my only claim on respectability. In the first place, I didn't expect an audience. In the second, that will do, sir, broke in this heavy person in a quarter-deck voice. Who, may I ask, are you? You may, I replied. I am a God-fearing sailor-man who is doing the best he can to keep nice and clean in spite of the uncalled-for intervention of a red-faced oaf of a plumber person who should know better than to stand around watching him. Don't take on so, George, said one of the women whom I suspecting of edging around in order to get a better view of me. The poor young man is a sailor. Where is your patriotism? Yes, broke in the other woman, edging around the other side. He's one of our sailor boys. Treat him nice. Patriotic I am, roared George wrathfully, but not to the extent of condoning and looking lightly upon such a flagrant breach of decency as this semi-nude so-called sailor has committed in our midst. If you give me a couple of thrift stamps, I suggested, I might be able to come out from behind this blooming barrage. Shameless, exploded the man. Not at all, I replied. In the olden days, it was quite customary for young gentlemen and elderly stout ones like yourself, for instance, to drop in at the best caves with very much less on than I have without anyone considering their conduct in any degree irregular. In fact, the ladies of this time were no better themselves it being deemed highly proper for them to appear in some small bit of stuff, and nobody thought the worst of it at all. Take the early days of the 15th century BC. At this point in my eloquent address, a young child, who had hitherto escaped my attention, took it upon herself to swing on the line, with the result that it parted with a snap, and my last vestige of protection came fluttering to the roof. For one tense moment I stood gazing into the dilated eyes of those before me. Then, with surprising presence of mind, I sprang to a ladder that led to the water tank, swarmed up it with the agility of a cat, and lowered myself with a gasp of despair into the cold, cold water of the tank. From this place of security I gazed down on the man who had been responsible for my unfortunate plight. I felt myself sinned against, and the longer I remained in that water, up to my neck, the more I felt my wrongs. I gave voice to them. I said bitter, abusive things to the man. Clear the quarter deck, I shouted. Get aft, or by gad I'll come fluttering down there on your flat, bald head like a blooming flood. Vamoose, hombre, pronto, plenty quick and take your brood with you. Then I said some more things, as my father before me has said them, and the man withdrew with his women. He's a sailor, he said as he did so. But my dears, this is worse than nakedness. I emerged and sat in a borrowed bathrobe the rest of the evening. The next morning my clothes were still damp. Now that's what I call a stupid way to spend a Saturday night on liberty. The fat people enjoyed it. I met a very pleasant dog yesterday, whom I called Mr. Fogarty, because of his sober countenance and the benign but rather puzzled expression in his large, limpid eyes, which were almost completely hidden by his bangs. He was evidently a visitor in camp, so I took him around and introduced him to the rest of the dogs and several of the better sort of goats. In all of these he displayed a friendly but dignified interest seeming to question them on the life of the camp, how they liked the navy, and what they thought were the prospects for an early peace. He refused to be separated from me, however, and even broke into the mess hall, from which he was unceremoniously ejected, but not before he had gotten half of my ration. In some strange manner, he must have found out from one of the other dogs my name and address, and exactly where I swung for in the middle of the night I awoke to hear a lonesome whining in the darkness beneath my hammock, and then the sniff-sniff of an investigating nose. 
as I know how it feels to be lonely in a big black barracks in the dead of night, I carefully descended to the deck and collected this animal. It was my old friend, Mr. Fogarty, and he was quite overjoyed at having once more found me. After licking my face in gratitude, he sat back on his haunches and waited for me to do something amusing. I didn't have the heart to leave him there in the darkness. Dogs have a certain way about them that gets me every time. I lifted Mr. Fogarty, a huge hulk of a dog, with much care and adjusting of overlapping paws into my hammock, and received a kiss in the eye for my trouble. Then I followed Mr. Fogarty into the hammock and resumed my slumber, but not with much comfort. Mr. Fogarty is a large, sprawly dog who evidently has been used to sleeping in vast spaces and who sees no reason for changing a lifelong habit. Consequently, he considered me in the nature of a piece of gratifying upholstery. He slept with his hind legs on my stomach and his front paws propped against my chin. When he scratched, as he not infrequently did what I decided must be a flea, his hind leg beat upon the canvas and produced a noise not unlike a drum. Thus we slept, but through some miscalculation I must have slept over, for it seemed that the master at arms, a very like and capable Irishman, came and shook my hammock. Hit the deck there, sailor, he said. Shake a leg, shake a leg. At this point, Mr. Fogarty took it upon himself to peer over the side of the hammock to see who this disturber of peace and quiet could be. This was just a little out of the line of duty for the Jimmy Legs, and I can't say I blame him for his conduct under rather trying circumstances. Mr. Fogarty has a large, shaggy head, not unlike a lion's, and his mouth too is quite large and contains some very long and sharp teeth. It seems that Mr. Fogarty, still heavy with slumber, quite naturally yawned into the horrified face of the Jimmy Legs, who, Mistaking the operation for a hostile demonstration, retreated from the barracks with admirable rapidity for one so large, crying in a distracted voice as he did so. By the saints, it's a beast he's turned into during the night. Sure, it's a visitation of providence. Heaven preserve us. It seems I've been washing hammocks ever since. Mr. Fogarty sits around and wonders what it's all about. I like Fogarty but he gets me in trouble. And in this, I need no help whatsoever. End of part six. Part seven of Biltmore Oswald, The Diary of a Hapless Recruit by J. Thorne Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nigel Boydell Part 7 July 1st This day I almost succeeded in sinking myself for the final count. The fishes around about the environs of City Island were disappointed beyond words when I came up for the fourth time and stayed up. In my delirium, I imagined that school had been let out in honour of my reception and that all the pretty little fishes were sticking around in expectant groups, cheering loudly at the thought of the conclusion of their meatless days. Fortunately for the Navy, however, I cheated them and saved myself in order to scrub many more hammocks on white clothes, an object to which I seem to have dedicated my life. It all come about, as do most drowning parties, in quite an unexpected manner. For some reason, it had been arranged that I should take a swim over at one of the emporiums at City Island, and, as I interposed no objections, I accordingly departed with my faithful Mr. Fogarty tumbling along at my heels. Since Mr. Fogarty involved me in trouble the other day by barking at the Jimmy Legs, he has endeavoured in all possible ways to make up for his thoughtless irregularity. For instance, he met me this morning with an almost brand new shoe, which in some manner he had managed to pick up in his wanderings. It fits perfectly, and if he only succeeds in finding the mate to it, I shall probably not look for the owner. 
As a further proof of his goodwill, Mr. Fogarty bit, or attempted to bite, a P.O., who spoke to me roughly regarding the picturesque way I was holding my gun. "'Whose dog is that?' demanded the P.O. Silence in the ranks. Mr. Fogarty looked defiantly at him for a moment, and then trotted deliberately over and sat down upon my foot. "'Oh, so he belongs to you?' continued the P.O. in a threatening voice. "'No, sir,' I faltered. "'You see, it isn't that way at all. "'I belong to Mr. Fogarty.' "'Who in... who in... who is Mr. Fogarty?' shouted the P.O. "'And how in... how in... how did he happen to get into the conversation?' "'Why, this is Mr. Fogarty,' I replied. "'This dog here, sitting on my foot.' "'Oh, is that so?' jeered the P.O., a man noted for his quick retorts. "'Well, you take your silly-looking dog away from here and secure him in some safe place. He ain't no fit associate for our camp dogs, and furthermore,' he added, "'the next time Mr. Fogarty attempts to bite me, I'm going to put you on report. Savvy?' "'Mr. Fogarty is almost as much of a comfort in camp as mother.' Well, that's another something else again, and has nothing to do with my swim and approximate drowning at City Island. Swimming has always been one of my strong points, and I have taken in the past no little pride in my appearance, not only in bathing outfit, but also in the water. However, the suit they provided me with on this occasion did not show me up in a very alluring light. It was quite large, and evidently built according to a model of the early Victorian era. I was swathed in yards of cloth, much in the same manner as is a very young child. It delighted Mr. Fogarty, who expressed his admiration by attaching himself to the lower half of my attire, and remaining there until I had waded through several colonies of barnacles far out into the bay. Bidding farewell to Mr. Fogarty at this point, I gave myself over to the joy of the moment, and went wallowing along, giving a surprising imitation of the famous Australian crawl. Far in the distance I sighted an island to which I decided to swim. This was a very poor decision indeed, because long before I had reached the spot, I was in a sinking condition, owing to the great heaviness of my suit, and a tremendous slacking down of lung power. It was too late to retreat to the shore. The island was the nearest point and that wasn't near. On I gasped, my mind teeming with tearless thoughts of the ocean's bed waiting to receive me. Just as I was about to shake hands with myself for the last time, I cleared the water from my eyes and discovered that the island, though still distant, was not altogether impossible. Therewith I discarded the top part of my suit and struck out once more. The island was now almost within my grasp. Life seemed to be not so much a lost cause after all. Then suddenly, quite clearly, just as I was about to pull myself up on the shore, I saw a woman standing on the bank and heard her shouting in a very conversational voice, Private property! Private property! I sank. This was too much. As I came up for the first count, and just before I sank back beneath the blue, I had time to hear her repeat, Private property! Please keep off! I went down very quickly this time and very far. When I arose, I saw, as though in a dream, another woman standing by the first one and seemingly arguing with her. "'He's drowning,' she said. "'I'm sure I can't help that,' the other one answered, and then in a loud, imperious voice, "'Private property, no visitors allowed.' The water closed over my head and stilled her hateful voice. "'No,' she was saying as I came up for the third time, "'I can't do it. "'If I make an exception of one, "'I must make an exception of all. "'Although I hated to be rude about it, "'having always disliked forcing myself upon people, "'I decided on my fourth trip down "'that unless I wanted to be a dead sailor, "'I had better be taking steps. "'It was almost too late. "'There wasn't enough wind left in me "'to fatten a small-sized bubble. "'There he is again!' she cried in a petulant voice as I once more appeared. Why doesn't he go away? He's just about to, for good, said the other lady. With a pitiful yap, I struck out feebly in the general direction of the shore. It wouldn't work. 
my arms refused to move. Then quite suddenly and deliriously I felt two soft, cooled arms enfold me, and my head sank back on a delicately unholstered shoulder. Somehow it reminded me of the old days. Home, James, I murmured as I was slowly towed to shore. Just before closing my eyes, I caught a fleeting glimpse of a young lady clad in one of the one-piecest one-piece bathing suits I had ever seen. She was bending over me sympathetically. "'Private property!' cried my tormentor, shaking a finger at me. "'What a pity,' I thought, as I closed my eyes and drifted off into sweet dreams in which Mr. Fogarty, my beautiful rescuer, and myself were dancing hand in hand on the parade ground to the music of the massed band, much to the edification of the entire station assembled in review formation. Presently, I walked to the hateful strains of this old hard shell's voice. "'See what you've done,' she was saying to the young girl. "'You've brought in a half-naked man, "'and now he has seen you in a much worse condition than he is. "'We'll have ten thousand sailors swimming out to this island "'in one continuous swarm.' "'Oh, won't that be fun?' cried the girl. "'And from that time on, in spite of the objections of her mother, "'we were fast friends.' "'When I returned to shore, it was in a rowboat with this fair young creature.' The faithful Fogarty was waiting on the beach for me, where, it later developed, he had been sleeping quite comfortably on an unknown woman's high-powered sports hat, as is only reasonable. July 2nd. Mother got in again. There seems to be no practical way of keeping her out. This time she came breezing in with a friend from East Aurora, a large elderly woman of about 110 summers and an equal number of very hard winters. The first thing Mother said was to the effect that she was going to see what she could do about getting me a rating. She did. The very first officer she saw she sailed up to and buttonholed much to my horror. Why can't my boy Oswald have a pretty little eagle on his arm, such as I see so many of the young men up here wearing about the camp? The abruptness of this question left the officer momentarily stunned. But I will say for him that he rallied quickly and returned a remarkably diplomatic reply to the effect that the pretty little eagle, although pleasing to gaze upon, was not primarily intended to be so much of a decoration as means of identification, and that certain small qualifications were required as a rule before one was permitted to wear one of the emblems in question. Qualification, he hastened to add, which he had not the slightest doubt that I failed to possess if I was the true son of my mother, but which, owing to fate and circumstances, I had probably been unable to exercise. Whereupon he bid her a very courteous good day, returned my salute, and passed on. But not before the very old lady accompanying my mother saluted also, raising her hand to her funny bit of a bonnet with unnecessary snappiness and snickering in a senile manner. This last episode upset me completely, but the old lady was irrepressible. From that time on, she punctuated her progress through the camp with exaggerated salutes to all the officers she encountered on the way. This, of course, was quite a startling and undignified performance for one of her years, very embarrassing to me as well as mystifying to the officers, who hardly knew whether to hurl me into the brig as a vicarious atonement or to rebuke the flighty old creature on the grounds of undue levity. Most of them passed by, however, with averted eyes and a discountenanced expression, feeling, I'm sure, that I had put her up to it. Mother thought it quite amusing and enjoyed my discomfiture hugely. Then, for no particular reason, she began to garnish her conversation with inappropriate seagoing expressions such as Pipe down, hit the deck, avast, and hello, buddy. Where she ever picked up all this nonsense, I am at a loss to discover, but she continued to pull it to the bitter end. Hello, buddy, was the way she greeted the jimmy legs of my barracks after I had introduced her to him with much elaboration. This completely floored the poor lad and rendered him inarticulate. He thinks now that I come from either a family of thugs or maniacs, probably the latter. I succeeded in shaking the old thing for a while, 
and when I found her, she was demonstrating the proper method of washing whites to a group of sailors assembled in the washroom of one of our most popular latrines. She was heading in the direction of the shower baths when I finally rounded her up. She was a game old lady. I'll have to hand her that. Her wildest escapade was reserved for the end of her visit when I took her over to the K and C hut and she challenged any sailor present to a game of pool for a quarter of all. When we told her that the sailors in the Navy never gambled, she said that she was completely off the service and that she thought it was high time that we learned to do something useful instead of singing sentimental songs and weaving ourselves into intricate figures. This remark forced us to it and much against our wills we proceeded to show the old lady up at pool. She had been bluffing all along, and when it came to a showdown, we found that she couldn't shoot for shucks. When the news spread around the hut, the sailors crowded about her, thick as thieves, challenging her to play. She was a wild, unregenerate old lady, but she was by no means an easy mark, as it later developed when she matched them for the winnings, got it all back, and I am told by some sailors that she even left the hut a little ahead of the game. I don't object to notoriety, but there are numerous ways of winning it that are objectionable, and this old lady was one. Mother must have been giddier in her youth than I ever imagined. July 3rd Yesterday I lost my dog Fogarty and didn't find him until late in the afternoon. He was up in front of the first regiment, mustered in with the Liberty Party. When he discovered my presence, he looked coldly at me, as if he had never seen me before, so I knew that he had a date. He just sat there and shook his bangs over his eyes and tried to appear as if he was somewhere else. When the order came to shove off, he joined the party and trotted off without even looking back, and that was the last I saw of him until this morning, when he came drifting in, rather unsteadily, and regarded me with a shifty but insulting eye. I am rapidly discovering hitherto unsuspected depths of depravity in Mr. Fogarty, which leads me to believe that he is almost human. July 4th This has been the doggonest 4th of July I ever spent, and as a result I am in much trouble. All day long I have been grooming myself to look spick and span at the review held in honour of the secretary when he opened the new wing to the camp. I missed it. I lost completely something in the neighbourhood of 10,000 men. It seems hard to do, but the fact, the ghastly fact, remains that I did it. When I dashed out of the barracks with my newly washed, splendid sea-going, still damp white hat in my hand, my company was gone and the whole camp seemed deserted. Far in the distance I heard the music of the band. Fogarty looked inquiringly at me, and I fled. He fled after me. Fogarty, I gasped. This is a trick I have to pull off alone. You're not in this review, and for God's sake act reasonable. I couldn't bear the thought of chasing across the parade ground with that simple-looking dog bounding along at my heels. My remark had no effect. Fogarty merely threw himself into high, and together we sped in the direction of the music. It was too late. Thousands of men were swinging past in review, and in all that mass of humanity there was one small vacant space that I was supposed to fill. I crouched down behind a tree and observed the scene through stricken eyes. How could I possibly have managed to lose nearly 10,000 men it seemed incredible, and I realised that I alone could have accomplished such a feat. And I had been so nice and clean too, and I had worked so hard to be all of those things. I bowed my head in misery, and Mr Fogarty, God bless his dissolute soul, crept up to me and tried to tell me it was all right, and didn't much matter anyway. I looked down and discovered that my snow-white hat was all muddy. Fogarty sat on it. July 8th. As a result of my being scratched out of the Independence Day Review, I have been tried out as punishment in all sorts of disagreeable positions, all of which I have filled with an inefficiency only equalled by the bad temper of my overlords. 
Some of these tasks, one in particular, was of such a ridiculous nature that I refused to enter it into my diary for an unfeeling posterity to jeer at. I am willing to state, however, that the accomplishments of Hercules, that redoubtable handyman of mythology, were trifling in comparison with mine. To begin with, the coal pile is altogether too large and my back is altogether too refined. There should be individual coal piles provided for temperamental sailors. Small, colourful, appetisingly shaped mounds of nice, clean, glistening chunks of coal they should be, and the coal itself could easily be made much lighter, approaching, if possible, the weight of feathers. This would be a task any reasonably inclined sailor would attack with relish, particularly if his efforts were attended by the strains of some good snappy jazz. However, reality wears a graver face and a sootier one. Long did I labour, and valiantly, but to little effect. More coal fell off my shovel than remained on it. This was due to the unfortunate fact that coal dust seems to affect me most unpleasantly, much in the same manner as daisies or goldenrod affect hay fever sufferers. The result was that every time I had my shovel poised in readiness to hurl its burden into space, a monolithic sneeze overpowered me, shook me to the keel, and all the coal that I had trapped with so much patience and cunning fell miserably around my feet, from whence it had lately risen. Little things like this become most discouraging when strung out for a great period of time. In this manner I sneezed and sweated through the course of a sweltering afternoon. And just as I was about to call it a day, along comes an evilly inclined coal wagon and dumps practically in my lap one hundred times more coal than I had disturbed in the entire course of my labours. On top of this, Fogarty, who had been loafing around all day with his tongue out, disporting himself on the coal pile like a dog in the first snow, started a landslide somewhere above and came bearing down on me in a cloud of dust. I found myself buried beneath the delighted Fogarty and a couple of tons of coal, from which I emerged unbeamingly, but not before Mr. Fogarty had addressed his tongue to my blackened face as an expression of high good humour. Take me to the brig, I said, walking over to the P.O. I'm through. You can put a service flag on that coal pile for me. What's consuming you, buddy? asked the P.O. in a not unkindly voice. Take me to the brig, I repeated. It's too much. Here I've been working diligently all day to reduce the size of this huge mass, when up comes that old wagon and humps its back and belches forth its horrid contents all over the place. It's ridiculous. I surrender my shovel. God, breathed the P.O., looking at me pityingly. We don't want to go and reduce that coal pile. We want to enlarge it. Oh, I replied, stunned. I didn't quite understand. I thought you wanted to make it smaller. So I've been trying to shovel it away all afternoon. You should not have done that, replied the P.O., as if he were talking to an idiot. I suppose you've been shoveling a downhill all day. I admitted that I had. You see, I added engagingly, I began with trying to shovel her uphill, but the old stuff kept on rolling down on me, so I drew the natural conclusion that I'd better shovel her downhill. It seemed more reasonable and... Easier, suggested the P.O. Yes, I agreed. There was a faraway expression in his eyes when he next spoke. I'd recommend you for an ineptitude discharge, he said, if it wasn't for the fact that I have more consideration for the civilian population. I'd gladly put you in the brig for life if I could feel sure that you wouldn't injure it in some way. The only thing left for me to do is to make you promise that you'll keep away from our coal pile and swear never to lay violent hands on it again. You'll spoil it. I gazed up at the monumental mass of coal rearing itself like a dark town matterhorn above my head and swore fervently never to molest it again. Go back to your outfit and get washed and tell your P.O. for me that you can't come here no more. And, he added as I was about to depart, take that unusual looking bit of animal life with you. It's all wrong. Police his body or he'll ruin some of your pal's white pants and they wouldn't like that at all. I feared they wouldn't. Yes, sir, I replied in a crumpled voice. Much obliged, sir. 
please go away now, he said quietly, or I think I might do you an injury. He was fingering the shovel nervously as he spoke. Thus Fogarty and I departed, banished even from our dusky St. Helena. July 9th Working on the theory of opposites, I was next placed as a waiter in the chief petty officer's mess over in the 1st Regiment. I wasn't so good here, it seems. There was something wrong with my technique. The coal pile had ruined me for delicate work. I continually kept mistaking the plate in my hand for a shovel, a mistake which led to disastrous results. I will say this for the chief, however. They were as clean-cut, hard-eating a body of men as I have ever met. It was a pleasure to feed them, particularly so in the case of one chief, a venerable gentleman who seemed both by his bearing and the number of stripes on his sleeve to be the dean of the mess. He ate quietly, composedly and to the point, and after I had spilled a couple of plates of rations on several of the other chap's laps, he suggested as I call it today and be withdrawn in favour of one whose services to his country were not so invaluable as mine. Appreciating his delicacy, I withdrew, but only to be sent out on another job that defies description. Even here I quickly demonstrated my unfitness and have consequently been incorporated once more into the body of the regiment. End of Part 7Part 8 of Biltmore Oswald, The Diary of a Hapless Recruit by J. Thorne Smith This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nigel Boydell Part 8 July 10th I had the most terrible experience in mess today when a guy having eaten more rapidly than I, attempted to take my ration. When I told him he shouldn't do it, he merely laughed brutally and kicked me an awful whack on the shin. This injury, together with the sight of witnessing my food about to be crammed down his predatory maw, succeeded in bringing all my latent patriotism to the fore, and I fell upon him with a desperation bred of hunger. We proceeded to mill it up in a rather futile, childish manner, until the master at arms suggested in a certain way he has that we go away to somewhere else. Hereafter, if anyone asks if I did any actual fighting in the war, I am going to say, yes, I fought like hell, many hard and long battles in camp for my ration, which will be true. Say, buddy said my opponent, after we had landed quite violently on the exterior of the mess hall. You didn't get no food at all, did you? No, I replied bitterly. At all is right. He looked at me for a moment in a strange, studying manner, then began laughing softly to himself. I don't know what made me do it, he said more to himself than to me. I wasn't hungry no more. I didn't really want it. I wonder what makes a guy brutal. Guess he sort of has a feeling to experiment with himself and other folk. I wish you'd tried that experiment on someone else, I replied, thinking tenderly of my shin. Sometimes I feel so doggone strong and mean, he continued. I just can't keep from doing things I don't naturally feel like doing. I guess I'm sort of an animal. Say, I asked him in surprise. If you keep talking about yourself that way, I won't be able to call you all the names I am carefully preparing at this moment. He appeared earnestly down on me for a space. Does my face make you talk that way? I asked, feeling dimly and uncomfortably that it did. Yes, he replied. It's your face, your foolish looking face. I can't help feeling sorry for it and your funny, empty little belly. You're breaking me down, I answered. I can't stand kindness. I ain't no bully, he said fiercely, as if he was about to strike me. I ain't no bully, he replied. I'll tell you that. No, sir, I replied soothingly, keeping on the alert. You ain't no bully. Here, he took me by the arm and dragged me along with him. Come on, buddy, 
he said. I'm going to take you to the canteen and feed you. I'm going to do it, I swear to God. So he fed me. Stacks and stacks of stuff he forced on me until the flesh rebelled. After which he put things in my pockets, repeating every little while, I ain't no bully, I'll tell you that, I ain't no bully. He spent most of his money, I reckon, but I did not try to stop him. He wanted to do it, and I guess it made him feel better. After the orgy, I took him around and let him pat Mr. Fogarty. He seemed to like this. Fogarty took it in good part. July 11th There's something about Wednesday afternoons that doesn't appeal to me. First, they make you go away and dress yourself up nice and clean, and then they look you over and make you feel nearly as childish as you look. Then they put a gun into your hand that is much too heavy for comfort and make you do all sorts of ridiculous things with this gun, after which you fall in with numerous thousands of other men who have been subjected to the same treatment and together we all go trotting past any number of officers who look you over with uncanny earnestness through eyes that seem to perceive their immortest defect with fiendish accuracy. Then we all trot home again and call it a review. This is all very well for some people, but not for me. I'm a little too self-conscious. I have always the feeling that I am the review, that it has been staged particularly for my discomfiture, and that every officer in camp is on the lookout for any slight irregularity in my clothes or conduct. In this they have little difficulty. I assist them greatly myself. Today, for instance. Item 1. Dropped my gun. Item 2. Talked in ranks. I asked a guy next to me how he would like to go to a place, and he said that he'd see me there first. Item 3. Failed to follow the guide. Item 4. Didn't mark time correctly. Item 5. Was in step once. Now all these things are trifling in themselves, but taking on mass, as it were, it leads up to a sizable display. At least so I was told in words that denied any other interpretation by my P.O. and several pals of his. After this review, our regimental commander lined us up and addressed us as follows. About that review today, he began. It was terrible. Long, dramatic pause. It was probably the worst review I have ever seen. Several POs glanced at me reproachfully. Not only that, he continued, but it was the worst review that anybody has ever seen. Anybody! Shouted. Without exception. Shouted. Awful review. Pause. Terrible. We steadied in the ranks and waited for our doom. It will never be so again, he continued. I'll see to that. I'll drill you myself. If you have to get up at four o'clock in the morning to drill in order to meet your classes, I'll see that you do it. Dropping guns. Pause. Talking in ranks. Pause. Out of step. Terrible pause. Marking time wrong. Everything wrong. Company commanders, take them away. We were took away. All of those things, said my P.O. in a trembling voice, you did all of them. Now the old man's sore on us, and he's going to give us hell, and I'm going to do the same by you. Shoot, dearie, says I, with the desperate indifference of a man who has nothing left to lose. I wouldn't feel natural if you didn't. And in my hammock that night, I thought of another thing I might have said if it had occurred to me in time. I might have said, Hell is the only thing that you know how to give, and you're generous with that because it's free. But I guess, after all, it's just as well I didn't. August 1st Mr. Fogarty has returned aboard. My worst fears are realised. For a long time he has been irritable and uncommunicative with me and has indulged in sly, furtive little tricks unbecoming to a dog of the service. I have suspected that he was concealing a love affair from me. This, it appears, he has been doing, and his guilt is heavy upon me. 
I realise now for the first time, and not without a sharp maternal pang, that he has reached an age at which he must make decisions for himself. I can no longer follow him out into the world upon his nocturnal exploits. His entire confidence is not mine. I must be content to share a part of his heart instead of the whole of it. Like father, like son, I suppose. However, I see no reason for him to put on such airs. On his return from City Island this time, he has somehow contrived to get himself completely shaved up to the shoulders. The result is startling. Fogarty looks extremely aristocratic, but a trifle foppish. However, he seems to consider himself the only real four-footed dog in camp. This is a trifle boring from a dog who has never hesitated to steal from the galley anything that wasn't a permanent fixture. I can't help but feel sorry for him, though, when I see that faraway look in his eyes. Sad days, I fear, are in store for him. Ah, well, we're only young once. August 3rd Well now, son, he was saying. Mind me when I tell you that I'm not claiming as to ever have seen a mermaid. But what I am saying is this, and that is, if anybody has ever seen one of them things, I'm that man. I'm not making no false claims, however, none whatsoever. I carefully placed my shovel against the wheelbarrow and, seating myself upon a stump, prepared to listen to my companion. He was a chief of many cruises, and for some unaccountable reason had fixed on me being as being a suitable recipient for his discourse. One more harsh mark on his arm would have made him look like a convict. I listened, and in the meanwhile many mounds of sand urgently in need of shoveling remained undisturbed. Upon this sand I occasionally cast a reflective and apprehensive eye. The chief, noticing this, nudged me in the ribs with an angular elbow. "'Don't mind that, Sonny,' he said. "'I'll plump the fear of God into the heart of any P.O. one endeavours to disturb you. Trust me.' I did. "'Now get him back to this mermaid,' he began in a confidential voice. "'What I say as I didn't claim to have saw. "'It happened this way, and what I'm telling you, Sonny, "'is the plain, unvarnished facts of the case. "'Take em or leave em as you will. "'They happened, and I'm here to tell the whole world so.' "'I have every confidence in you, Chief,' I replied mildly. "'It is well you have,' he growled, scanning my face suspiciously. "'It's well you have, you louse.' "'Why, Chief!' I exclaimed in an aggrieved voice. "'Isn't that rather an unappetizing word to apply to a fellow creature?' "'Mayhap, young feller,' he replied. "'Mayhap I ain't no deep-sea dictionary diver, I ain't, "'for all this has got nothing to do with what I was about to tell you. "'It all happened in this manner. "'Neither no more nor no less.' "'He cleared his throat and gazed with undisguised hostility across the parade ground. Thus he began. It was during the summer of 1888, some thirty-odd years ago, quoth he. I was a bit young then, but never such a way face as you. Certainly not. Positively, said I in hearty agreement. At that time, he continued, not noticing my remark, I was resting easy on a soft job between cruises as night watchman on one of them P.O. docks at Dover. The work weren't hard, but it were hard enough. I would never have taken it had it not been for the unpleasant fact that owing to some little trouble I had gotten into in one of the pubs, my wife was in one of her nasty brow-beating moods. At these times, the solitude and the stars together with the grateful companionship of a couple of buckets of beer was greatly to be preferred to my little old home. So I took the job and accordingly spent my night sitting with my back to a pile, my legs comfortably stretched out along the rim of the dock and a bucket of beer within easy reach. Could anything be further than that? said I. Nothing, said he, and continued. Well, one night, as I was sitting there looking down in the water, as a man does when his mind is empty and his body well disposed, I found myself gazing down into two glooming pools that weren't the reflection of stars. Above these two flecks of light was perched a battered old leghorn hat, after the style affected in the music halls of those days. 
floating out back of this hat on the water was a long, wavy coil of filmy hair. The face was shaded, but two long, slim arms were thrust out of the water towards me, and following these arms down a bit, I was shocked and surprised to find that further than the hat the young lady below me was apparently innocent of garments. Now I believe in going out with the boys when the occasion demands and making a bit of a time of it, but my folks have always been good, honest church people and believers in good, strong, modest clothing and plenty of them. I have always followed their example. Reluctantly and at a great distance, said I, not at all, said he, and continued. So when I seized the condition the young lady was in, I was naturally very much put out and didn't hesitate telling her so. Go home, says I, and put your clothes on. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, a great big girl like you. Oh, pipe down, old grizzle face, says she. What have you got in the bucket? And if you will believe me, she began rising herself out of the water, "'Give me some,' says she. "'Stop!' I cries out, exasperated. "'Stop where you are. "'You've gone far enough for shame.' "'I'll come all the way out,' says she, laughing, "'unless you give me some of what you got in that bucket.' "'Shame,' I repeated. "'Ain't you got no sense of decency?' "'None whatsoever,' she replied. "'For I'm awfully thirsty. "'Give me a drink, or out I'll come.' "'Now you can see for yourself "'that I couldn't afford to have a woman in her get-up sitting around with me on the end of a dock, being married as I was, and my folks all good, honest church folk, and bright moon shining in the sky to boot. So I was just naturally forced to give in to the brazen thing and reach her down the bucket, a full one at that. It came back empty, and she was forwarder than ever. Say, she cries out, swimming around most exasperatingly, you're a nice old party. What do you folks know you by? I told her my name was none of her business and that I was a married man and that I wished she'd go away and let me go on with my night watching. I'm married too, says she in a conversational tone, to an awful mess. You're pretty fuzzy, but I'll swap him for you any day. Come on into the sea with me and we'll swim down to goldfish arms and stick around until we get a drink. I know lots of boys down there. There ain't no liquor dealers where I come from. And with this, you'll believe me, she flits a bucket full of water in my lap with the neatest little scale-spangled tail you ever saw. No, says I, my mind's made up. I ain't going to go swimming around with no semi-stewed, altogether nude mermaid. It ain't right. It ain't Christian. I got a hat, says she reflectively, and I ain't so stewed but what I can't swim. What do you think of that hat? One of the boys stole it from his old woman and gave it to me. Come on, let's take a swim. No, says I, I ain't a-going. Just cause I ain't all dolled up in a lot of clothes, says she. Partly, says I, and partly because you're a mermaid. And I ain't a-going messing around through the water with no mermaid. I ain't never done it, and I ain't a-going to begin it now. If I get some clothes on and dress all up pretty, will you go swimming with me then? She asked pleadingly. Well, that's another thing, says I, non-committally like. All right, says she, give me something out of that other bucket and I'll go away. Come on, old sweetheart, and she held up her arms to me. Well, I gave her the bucket and true to form she emptied it. Then she began to argue and plead with me until I nearly lost an ear. No, I yells at her. I ain't going to spend the night arguing with a drunken mermaid. Go away now. You said you would. All right, old love, she replies good-naturedly. But I'll see you again sometime. I ain't ever going home again. I ate it down there. And off she swims in an unsteady manner in the direction of the goldfish arms. She was singing and shouting something terrible. Oh, bury me not on the lonesome prairie where the wild coyotes owl o'er me, was the song she sang, and I wonder where she'd ever picked it up. Well, continued the chief, to cast a sheep shank in a long line, these visits kept up every evening until I was pretty near drove distracted. 
along she'd come about sundown and stick around devilin' me and drinking up all me grog. After a while she began calling for gin and kept threatening me until I had just had to satisfy her. She also made me buy her a brush and comb, a mouth organ and a pair of spectacles, together with a lot of other stuff, on the strength of the fact that if I refused she would make a scene. In this way that dog on mermaid continually kept me broke, for my wages weren't enough to make me heavy and I had my home to support. "'Don't you ever go home?' I asked her one night. "'No,' she replied. "'I ain't ever going back home. I don't like it down there. There ain't no liquor dealers.' "'But your husband!' exclaims I. "'What of him?' "'I know,' says she. "'But I don't like him. And I'm off my baby too. It squints,' says she. "'But all babies squint,' says I. "'Mine shouldn't,' says she. "'It ain't right.' Then one night an awful thing happened. My wife came down to the dock to find out how I spent all my money. It was a bright moonlit night, and this lost soul of a mermaid was hanging around, particularly jilled and entreating. I was just in the act of passing her down the gin flask, and she was saying to me, Come on down, old love, you know you're crazy about me. When all of a sudden I heard an infuriated shriek behind me, and saw my wife leaning over the dock, shaking an umbrella at this hussy of a mermaid. "'Oh, son,' broke off the chief, "'if you only knew the uncontrolled violence and fury "'of two contending women. "'Nothing you meet on shipboard will ever equal it. "'I was speechless, rocked in the surf of a tumult of words, "'and in the midst of it all, what should happen? "'But the husband of the mermaid pops out of the water "'with a funny little bit of a merbaby in his arms. "'Go home at once, sir,' screams my wife, "'and put on your clothes.' I will, he shouts back, if my wife will come along with me. He was a weasened up little old man with a crooked back, not very prepossessing. I could hardly blame his wife. So that bit of stuff is your wife, is it? cries out my old lady, and with that she began telling him her past. I know it, says the little old merman at last, almost crying, I know it, but I ain't got no control over her whatsoever. I've been trying to get her to come home for the last fortnight, but she just won't leave off going around with the sailors. The whole beach is ashamed of her. It's general talk down below. What can I do? The little old coral house is going to rack and ruin, and the baby ain't been properly took care of since she left. What am I going to do, madam? What am I going to do? I'm well nigh distracted. But his wife was too taken up with the gin bottle to pay much heed to his pitiful words. She just kept flirting around in the water and singing snatches of bad sailor songs she picked up around the docks. Take her home, said my wife. Take her home, you weakling, by force. But I can't when she's in this condition. I got a child in my arms. Give me the baby, said my wife with sudden determination. I'll take care of it until tomorrow night when you can come back here and get it. He handed the flopping little thing up to my wife and turned to the mermaid. Lil, he says to her, holding out his arms to her. Lil, will you come home? Lil swims up to him then and takes him by the arm and looks at him for a long time. Kiss me, Archie, she says suddenly. I don't mind if I do. And flipping a couple of pounds of water upon the both of us on the pier, she pulls him under the water laughing, and that's the last I saw of either of them. Now I ain't a saying as I've ever seen a mermaid, mind you, continued the chief, but what I do say is that if any man has ever seen one, I'm the man. I understand perfectly, said I, and what chief became of the baby? Oh, the baby, said the chief thoughtful like. The baby, well, you see about the baby. He gazed searchingly around the landscape for a moment before replying. Oh, the baby, he says suddenly as if greatly relieved. Well, my wife took the baby home and kept it in the bathtub for a couple of days, after which she returned it in person to its father. She made me give up my job. It did squint, though, said the chief as he got up to go, ever so little. I turned to my shovel. But I ain't saying as I've ever seen a mermaid he said, turning back in his tracks. All I'm saying is that, I know, chief, I said wearily, 
I fully appreciate your delicacy and fairness. You are not the man to make any false claims. No, sir, not I, he replied as he walked slowly away. End of Part 8「Part Nine of Biltmore Oswald, the Diary of a Hapless Recruit by J. Thorne Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nigel Boydell. Part Nine. August fifth. In order to distract Mr. Fogarty's attention from his love affair, and in a sort of desperate endeavour to win him back to me, I took him away on my last liberty with me. Fogarty doesn't come under the heading of a lapdog, but through some technical quibble I managed to smuggle him into the subway. All he did there was to knock over one elderly lady and lick her face effusively when he'd gotten her down. This resulted in a small but complete panic. For the most part, however, he sat quietly on my lap and sniffed at those around him. At last we reached Washington Square, whereupon I proceeded to take Mr. Fogarty around and show him off to my friends. He was well received, but his heart wasn't with us. It was far away in City Island. At one restaurant we ran into a female whose hair was nearly as short as Fogarty's. She was holding forth on the silence of the soul versus the love impulse, the cabbage or some other plant. Fogarty listened to her for a while and then bit her. He did it quietly, but I thought it best to take him away. After supper we went up to another place for coffee, a fine little place for sailormen, situated on the south side of the square. Here we were received with winning cordiality and Fogarty was given a fried egg, a dish of which he is passionately fond. But even here he got into trouble by putting one of his great feet through a ukulele which isn't such a terrible thing to do, except in certain places. Getting back to the station was a crisp little affair. Fogarty and myself rose at five and went forth to the shuttle. The subway was a madhouse. We shuttled ourselves to death. At 5.30 we were at the Times Square end of the shuttle. At 5.45 we were at Williams. At six o'clock we had somehow managed to get ourselves on the east side end of the shuttle, Five minutes later, we were back at Times Square. Ten minutes later, we were over on the east side once more. At 6.15, I lost Fogarty. At 6.25, I was back at Times Square. Hello, buddy, said the guard. You back again? Here's your dog. At seven o'clock, we were at Van Cortland Park. At eight, we were at 96th Street. Nine o'clock found us labouring up to the gate of the camp with a written list of excuses that looked like the schedule of a flourishing railroad. It was accepted, much to our surprise. August 7th. I have a perfectly splendid idea. Of course, like the rest of my ideas, it won't work. But it is a perfectly splendid idea for all that. I got it while travelling on the ferry boat from New York to Staten Island the longest sea journey I have had since I joined the Navy. On this trip, strangely thrilling to a sailor in my situation, but which was suffered with bored indifference by the amphibious commuters that infest the island in those waters, I saw a number of ships so gaudily and at the same time so carelessly painted that any God-fearing skipper of the Spanish main would positively have refused to command. Captain Kidd himself would have blushed at the very sight of this ribald fleet and turned away with a devout imprecation. This was my first experience with camouflage and it impressed me most unfavourably. An ordinary ship on a grumbling ocean is difficult enough as it is to establish friendly relations with, but when trigged out in this manner, why serve meals at all, say I? Nevertheless, it occurred to me that it would not be a bad idea at all to camouflage one's hammock in such a manner that it took upon itself the texture and appearance of the bulkhead of the barracks in which it swung. In this manner, a sailor could sleep undisturbed for three weeks if he so desired, and he does, without ever being technically considered a deserter. 
One could elaborate this idea still further and make one's sea bag look like a clump of poison ivy, so that no inspecting officer would ever care to become intimate with its numerous defects in cleanliness. One might even go so far as to camouflage oneself into a writing desk, so that when visiting the Y or the KC, and unexpectedly required to sing, one would not be forced to rise and scream impatiently and threateningly, Dear Mother of Mine, or Break the News to Mother. Not that these songs are not things of rare beauty in themselves, but after a couple of days on the coal pile, one's lungs have been sufficiently exercised to warrant relief. This is merely an idea of mine, and now that everybody knows about it, I guess there isn't much use in going ahead with it. August 8th This guide is left, shouted the P.O., and naturally I looked around to see what had become of the poor fellow. Keep your eyes straight, eyes to the front, don't move, what are you looking at? I was looking for the guide that was left, said I timidly. It seems to me that he's always been left. Company dismissed, said the P.O. promptly showing a wonderful command of the situation under rather trying circumstances, for the boo-hoo that went up from the men after my remark defied all restraints of discipline. Say, Biltmore, says the P.O. to me a moment later, I'm going to see if I can't get you shipped to Siberia if you pull one of them bum jokes again. You understand? But I wasn't joking, I replied innocently. Oh, go on, you sly dog, said he, nudging me in the ribs, and for some strange reason he departed in high good humour, leaving me in a greatly mystified frame of mind. Speaking of getting shipped, I've just written a very sad song in the style of the old sentimental ballads of the Spanish war days. It's called The Sailor's Farewell, and I think Polly will like it. I haven't polished it up yet, but here it is, as it is. A sailor to his mother came and said, Oh, mother dear, I got to go away and fight the war. So, mother, don't you cry too hard and don't you have no fear when you find the time not sticking round no more. My boy, the sweet old lady said, I hate to see you go. I've known you since when you was but a kid. But if the question you should ask, I'll ask the whole world so. It's the only decent thing you ever did. A tear she brushed aside, and then she sadly cried. I'm proud my boy's a sailor, man for sails upon the sea. I've always liked him pretty well, although he is so dumb. For years he stuck around the house and disappointed me. I thought that he was going to be a bum. He took her gently by the hand and kissed her on the bean and said, when I'm about to fight the Hun. You shouldn't talk to me that way, I think it's awfully mean. I ain't a going to have a lot of fun. I know my child, the mother said, the parting makes me sad. But go, you must away and fight the war. At least you will not live to drink as much as did your dad. So here's the lid, my lad, and there's the door. Then as he turned away, he heard her softly say, The sailors I have ever loved, I'm glad my lad's a gob, although it seems to me he's much too dumb. But after all, perhaps he isn't such an awful slob, I always knew the Kaiser was a bum. August 9th The best way to make a deserter of a man is to give him too much liberty. For the past week I have been getting my dog Fogarty on the numerous liberty lists when he shouldn't have been there, but not contented with that he is taken to going around with a couple of yeomen and the first thing I know he will be getting on a special detail where the liberty is soft. I put nothing past that dog since he lost his head to some floppied hussy with a black and tan reputation. August 10th all day long, and a little longer, I've been carrying sacks of flour. The next time I see a stalk of wheat, I'm going to snarl at it. This new occupation is a sort of special penance for not having my hammock lashed in time. It seems that I have been in the service long enough to know how to do the thing right by now, but the seventh itch is a sly little devil and always gets me. I need a longer line or a shorter hammock. But the only way out of it that I can see is to get a commission and rate a bed. 
I carried all the flour today that was raised last year in the southern section of the state of Montana, and I was carrying it well and cheerfully until one of my pet fingernails, the one that the manicure girls in Biltmore used to rave about, thrust itself through the sack and precipitated its contents upon myself and the floor. A commissary steward, when thoroughly aroused, is a poisonous member of society. One would have thought that I had sunk the great fleet the way this bird went on about one little sack of flour. Here, Mr. Hoover works hard night and day all winter, he sobs at me, and you go spreading it around as if you were Marie Antoinette. I wondered what new scandal he had about Marie Antoinette, but I held my peace. My horror was so great that the real colour of my face made the flower look like a coat of sunburn in comparison. There's enough flour there, he continued reproachfully, pointing to the huge mound of stuff in which I stood like a lost explorer on a snow-capped mountain peak and wishing heartily that I was one. There's enough flour, he continued, to keep a chief petty officer in pie for twenty-four hours. Oh, just about, I thought to myself. Well, he cried irritably, pick it up, be quick, pick it up, all of it. Pick it up, I replied through a cloud of mist. You can't pick up flour. You can pick up apples and pears and cabbages and cigar butts, for that matter, but you can't pick up flour. The commissary steward suddenly handed me a piece of paper upon which he had been writing frantically. Take this to your P.O., he said shrilly, and take yourself along with it. A defect in the sack, I gasped, departing. And there's a defect in you, he shouted after me. Your brain is exempt. Take this man and kill him if you can find any slight technical excuse for it, the note ran. And if you can't kill him, give him an inaptitude discharge with my compliments. And if you are unable to do either of these two things, at least... Keep him away from my outfit. We don't want to see his silly face around here any more at all. The P.O. read it to me with great delight. I guess we'll have to send you to Siberia after all, he said thoughtfully. Only that country is in far too delicate a condition for you to meddle with it at present. Go away to somewhere where I can't see you, he continued bitterly. For I feel inclined to do you an injury, something permanent and serious. I went right away. August 11th Mother has just paid one of her belligerent visits to the camp, and as a consequence I am on the point of having a flock of brainstorms. Some misguided person has been telling her about the officer training school up here, and she arrived fired with the ambition to enter me in that institution without further delay. True to form, she bounded headlong into the matter without consulting my feelings by accosting the very first commissioned officer she met. He happened to be an ensign, but he might as well have been a vice-admiral for all mother cared. Tell me, young man, she said to this ensign, going directly to the point, do you see any reason why my boy Oswald should not go to that place where they make all the ensigns? Yes, said the officer firmly, I do. Oh, you do, snapped Mother angrily, and pray tell me what that reason might be. Your son Oswald, replied the ensign laconically. What, exclaimed Mother, you mean to say that my Oswald is not good enough to go to your silly old school? No, replied the ensign, weakening pitifully before the withering fury of an aroused mother. But you see, my dear madam, he has not a first-class rating. Fiddlesticks, said Mother. Crossed anchors, replied the ensign. I didn't mean that, continued Mother. I think the whole thing is very mysterious and silly, and I'm not going to let it stop here. You can trust me, Oswald, she went on soothingly. I'm going to see the commander of the station myself. I'm going this very instant. But, Mother, I cried in desperation, tossing all consequences to the wind. The skipper isn't on the station today. He's got a 43-hour liberty. I saw him check out of the gate myself. For a moment, the ensign's jaw dropped. I watched him anxiously. Then, with perfect composure, he turned to Mother and came through like a little gentleman. Yes, madam, he stated. Your son is right. I heard his name read out with the Liberty Party only a moment ago. He has shoved off by now. 
I could have kissed that ensign. Well, I'm sure, said Mother. It's very funny that I can never get to the captain. I shall write him, however. He must have an interesting collection of your letters already, I suggested. They would be interesting to publish in book form. Anyway, continued Mother, apparently not attending to my remark, I think you would look just as well as this young man in one of those nice white suits. No doubt, madam, replied the ensign propitiatingly. No doubt. Come, mother, said I, let's go to the YMCA. I need something cool to steady my nerves. How about your underwear, said mother, coming back to her mania, in a voice that invited all within earshot who were interested in my underwear to draw nigh and attend. Here, eat this ice cream, I put in quickly, almost feeding her. It's melting. But mother was not to be decoyed away from her favourite topic. I must look it over, she continued firmly. It seemed to me that every eye in the room was calmly penetrating my whites and carefully looking over my underwear in which mother took such an exaggerated interest. Socks, suddenly exploded mother. Are you off for socks? Splendidly, I said in a hoarse voice. A girl behind me snickered. And have you that liniment to rub on your stomach when you have cramps? She went on ruggedly. Enough to last through the fall season, I replied in a moody voice. I didn't tell her that Tim the barkeeper tried to drink it. Holly, suddenly exclaimed Mother. Holly, why, I forgot to tell you that she would be up this afternoon. She must be here by now. The world swam around me. Holly was my favourite sweetie. Oh, Mother, I cried reproachfully. How could you have forgotten? At that moment I heard a familiar voice issuing from the corner and turned around. I caught sight of the staff reporter of the camp paper, a notoriously unscrupulous sailor with predatory proclivities. He had gotten Polly in a corner and was chinning the ear off her. As I drew near, I heard him saying, Really, it's an awful pity, but I distinctly remember him saying that he was going away on liberty today. He mentioned some girl's name, but it didn't sound anything at all like yours. Polly looked at him trustfully. Are you sure, mister? Savon Roller, the lying wretch supplied without turning a hair. Are you sure, mister Savon Roller, that she has left the station? Saw him check out with my own eyes, he said calmly. I moved nearer, my hands twitching. Now with an honest old seafaring man like myself, he continued in a confidential voice, it's different. Why, if I should wear all the ash marks I rate, I'd look like a zebra. So I just don't wear any. You know how it is. But when I like a girl, I stick to her. Now from the very moment I laid eyes on you, human endurance could stand no more. I threw myself between them. Why, here's Oswald himself, exclaimed the reporter with masterful feigned surprise. However did you get back so soon? I have never been away anywhere to get back from, and you know it, I replied coldly. Strange, he said. I could have sworn that I saw you checking out. Can I get you some ice cream? He added smoothly. What on? I replied bitterly, knowing him always to be broke. Your mother must have. Come, said I to Polly, leave this degraded creature to ply his pernicious trade alone. I have some very important words to say to you. Goodbye, Mr. Savonrola, said Polly. Until we meet again, answered the reporter with the utmost confidence. August 12th. It's all arranged. Those words I had to say to Polly were not spoken in vain. She has promised to be my permanent sweetie. Of course, I have had a couple of transit sweeties in the past, but now I am going to settle down to one steady, day in and day out sweetie. I told Tim, the barkeep, about it last night, and all he said was, What about all those parties we'd planned after you were paid off? This sort of set me back for a moment. The spell of Polly's eyes had made me forget all about Tim. Well, Tim, I replied, I'll have to think about that. Come on over to the canteen and I'll feed you some of those honest, upstanding sandwiches they have over there. Say, says Tim, the carnal beast, forgetting everything at the prospect of food, 
I feel as if I could cover a flock of them without trying. So together, Tim and I had a bachelor's dinner over the sandwiches, which were worthy of that auspicious occasion. End of part nine. Part 10 of Biltmore Oswald, The Diary of a Hapless Recruit by J. Thorne Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nigel Boydell. Part 10. August 17th. We were standing on a street corner of a neighbouring town. The party consisted of Tim the barkeep, the spider, an individual who's modestly acknowledged credit for having brought relief to several overcrowded safes in the good old civilian days. Tony, who delivered ice in my district, also in those aforementioned days, and myself. These gentlemen, for some time, had been allowing me to exist in peace, and I had been showing my gratitude by buying them whatever little dainties they desired. But such a comfortable state of affairs could not long continue with that bunch. Suddenly, without any previous consultation, as if drawn together, as it were, by some fiendish undercurrent, they decided to make me unhappy. Me, the only guy that spoke unbroken English in the crowd. This is the way they accomplished their low ends. When the next civilian came along, they all of them shouted at me in tones that could be heard by all passers-by. Here comes a Sir William, buddy. He'll give you a quarter. Do you need some money, my boy? said the old gentleman to me in a kindly voice. No, sir, I stammered, getting red all over. Thank you very much, but I really don't need any money. Ironical laughter from my friends in the background. Oh, no, cries Tim sarcastically. He don't need no money. Just watch him when he sees the colour of it. Don't hesitate, my son, continued the kind old man. If you need anything, I would be glad to help you out. No, sir, I replied, turning away to hide my mortification. Everything is all right. Poor but proud, hisses the spider. The old gentleman passed on, sorely perplexed. For some time I was a victim of this crude plot. When I tried to move away, they followed me around the streets, crying after me. Any Sir William will give you a quarter. Go on, ask him. Several ladies stopped and asked if they could be of service to me. I assured them that they couldn't, but all the time these low sailors, who I had been feeding lavishly, kept jeering and intimating that I was fooling and would take any amount of money offered me from a dime up. This shower of conflicting statements always left the kind-hearted people in a confused frame of mind, and brought me up completely. I had to chase one man all the way down the street, and hand him back the quarter he had thrust into my hand. My friends never forgave me for this. At length, tiring of their sport, they desisted and stood gloomily on the curb as sailors do, looking idly at nothing. It don't look like we was ever going to get a hitch, said the spider, after we had abandonedly offered ourselves to several automobiles. At that moment, a huge machine rolled heavily by. There goes a piece of junk, said Tim. The lady in the machine must have heard him, for the car came to and she motioned for us to get in. Going our way? she asked, smiling at us. Thanks, lady, replied Tim, elbowing me aside as he climbed aboard. Dust your feet, I whispered to Tony as he was about to climb in. What do you mean a dust of my feet? shouted Tony wrathfully. You go ahead and dust your feet. I look after my feet all right. What did he want you to do, Tony? Asked Tim in a loud voice. Dust of my feet, answered Tony, greatly injured. What are you doing, Oswald? Asked Tim sarcastically. Trying to drag us up? I only spoke for the best, I answered, sick as heart. Ha ha, grated Tim. Guess you think we ain't never rode in one of these wealthy wagons before. Aren't you rather young? asked the lady soothingly of the spider, who by virtue of his mechanical experience in civil life had been given a first-class rating. Aren't you rather young to have so many things on your arm? Yes, answered the spider promptly, but I can do a lot of tricks. 
the conversation languished from that point. We always take our boys to dinner, don't we, dear? said the lady to her husband a little later. Yes, dear, he answered meekly, just like that. Expectant silence from the four of us. Have you boys had dinner? the lady asked. Certainly not, we cried with an earnestness that gave the lie to our statement. No dinner. Not at all, added Tim thoughtfully. The automobile drew up at a 14k plate glass house that fairly made the spider itch. Gosh, he whispered to me looking at the porch, that wouldn't be hard for me. During the dinner he kept sort of lifting and weighing the silver and then looking at me and winking in an obvious manner. Not many people here tonight, said Tony from behind his plate. Why, there is the usual number, said the husband in surprise. My wife and I live alone. Oh, said Tony looking around at the tremendous dining hall. I thought this was a restaurant. Tim started laughing then, and he hasn't stopped yet. He's so proud he didn't make the mistake himself. The spider didn't open his mouth save for the purpose of eating. He told me he was afraid his teeth would chatter. August 20th. Got a letter from Polly today. She says that her finger is just itching for the ring. I told the spider about it and said that he had several unset stones he'd let me have for next to nothing. A good burglar is one of the most valuable friends a man can possess. September 3rd. I had such a setback today. Never was I more confounded. This morning I received a notice to report before the examining board for a first class rating. Of course I had been expecting some slight recognition of my real worth for a long time, but when the blow fell I was hardly prepared for it. Hurrying to my blue jacket's manual, I succeeded by the aid of a picture in getting firmly in my mind the port and starboard side of a ship, and then I presented myself before the examiners, three doughty and unsmiling officers. There were about twelve of us up for examination. Seating ourselves before the three gentlemen, we gazed upon them with ill-concealed trepidation. One of them called the roll in a languid manner, and then without further preliminaries the battle began and I received the first shock of the assault. I don't quite remember the question the man asked me. It was all too ghastly at the time, but I think it was something like this. What would you do if you were at the wheel in a dense fog and you heard three whistles on your port beam, four whistles off the starboard bow, and a prolonged toot dead ahead? I will still remain in a dense fog, I gasped in a low voice. Speak up, snapped the officer. Full speed ahead and jumps, whispered the guy next to me. It sounded reasonable. I seized upon it eagerly. I'd put full steam ahead and jump, sir, I replied. Are you mad? shouted the amazed officer. No, sir, I hastened to assure him, only profoundly perplexed. I think, sir, that I will go into a conference under the circumstances. The officer seemed to be on the verge of a breakdown. What's your name? asked another officer suddenly. I told him. Initials? I told him. He looked at the paper for a moment. That explains it, he said with a sigh of relief. You're not the man. There's been some mistake. Orderly, take this man away and bring back the right one. Pronto. The Spanish stuff sounded awfully seagoing. I was taken away, but the officer had not yet recovered. He regarded me with an expression of profound disgust. Anyway, I created a sensation. September 4th. Things have been happening with overwhelming rapidity. On the strength of being properly engaged to Polly, my permanent sweetie, I went to my regimental commander this morning and applied for a furlough. He regarded me pityingly for a moment and then carefully scanned a list of names on the desk before him. I'm sorry, he said finally. But not only am I not able to grant your request, but I have the unpleasant duty to inform you that you are a little less than 48 hours from the vicinity of Ambrose Light. Shipped? I gasped as the words swam around me. Your name is on the list, said the officer not unkindly. Shipped? I repeated in a dazed voice. 
It does seem ridiculous, I'll admit, said the officer, smiling. But you can never tell what strange things are going to happen in the Navy. If I were in your place, I'd take advantage of this head start I've given you and get my clothes and sea bag in some sort of condition. If I remember rightly, you have never been able successfully to achieve this since you've been in the service. Thank you, sir, I gasped and bolted. In my excitement, I ran violently into a flock of ensigns stalking around the parade ground. I'm going to be shipped, I cried by way of explanation to one of them as he arose wrathfully. You're going to be damned, said he, and I was. Too frantic to write more. September 5th. All preparations have been made. Tim, Tony and the Spider are going too. I've just been listening to the most disturbing conversation. It all arose from our speculating as to our probable destination and the nature of our services. The Master of Arms, who had been sleeping on the hammock rack as only Master of Arms can, permitted himself to remain awake long enough to join in. I wouldn't be at all surprised, said he, if you were shipped to one of those new submarine provokers. What's that? I asked uneasily. Why, it's a sort of decoy, said he, stretching his huge hulk. A little unarmed boat that goes messing around in the ocean until it finds a submarine and then it provokes it. How's that? asked Tim. Why, you see, continued the Jimmy Legs. It just sort of steams back and forth in front of the submarine. Just steams slowly back and forth in front of the submarine until it provokes it. Ah, said I, taking a deep breath. Yes, he continued cheerfully. And the more you provoke the submarine, why, the harder it shoots at you. So, of course, it doesn't notice the real submarine seeker coming up behind it. See the tactics? Oh, says I, we just provoke the submarine until it loses its temper and the other boat sinks it. That's it, says the Jimmy Legs. You just sort of steams back and forth in front of it slowly. How slowly? asked the spider. Very, replied the Jimmy Legs. No guns at all? asked Tim. None, says he. A regular little home, suggests Tony. Sure, says the Jimmy Legs. Nothing to do at all but steam slowly back. For God's sake, don't dwell on that point any more, I cried. We understand it perfectly. A regular little home, muttered Tim as he began to stow his bag. Later. I write these lines with horror. Someone has told me that the Navy needs powder tasters, something I'd never heard of before, and that perhaps that's what we are going to be used for. All you have to do, this guy says, is to taste the powder to see if it's damp or dry, and if it's damp, you take it away and bake it. This sounds worse than the submarine provoker. Still later. Rumour is rife. The latest report is that we are going to be mine openers. What's a mine opener? I ask my informant. Why, it's a guy, says he, that picks up the mines floating around his boat, but only the German mines, of course, and opens them to see if they are as dangerous as they look. Some are not half as dangerous as they look, he continues easily. Some are not quite so dangerous, and of course some a great deal more so. But they're all dangerous enough. My dear chap, I replied, turning away miserably, a pinwheel is quite dangerous enough for me. September 6th. This is being written from the gate. My bag and hammock are beside me. Tim lashed them together for me so they wouldn't come undone. We are waiting for the truck. Tony, in his excitable way, wants to kiss the guard goodbye. The guard doesn't want him to. My last moments at Pelham have been hectic. The doctor said I looked 100% better than when I came in, but that wasn't enough. If you didn't look at me very closely, you wouldn't know that I was such an awful dub. This is progress at any rate. The telephone wires between Mother's house and the camp were dripping wet with tears when I phoned her that I was being shipped. However, she braced up and said she was proud of me and said she hoped I'd tell the captain goodbye and thank him for all he'd done. I assured her I would do this, 
or at least leave a note. Polly was a trump. The spider talked to her and said that he was going to save the best uncut stone for her that he had ever bitten out of a ring. The spider has been very valuable to us all. He seems to have the uncanny facility of being able to take the cloth straps off other people's clothes right before their eyes. Consequently, we are all well supplied. At present he's looking at the handle of the gate in a musing way. I think he would like to have it as a souvenir. Here comes the truck. Pelham is about to lose its most useless recruit. I must tuck these priceless pages into my money belt. Wish I had a picture of Polly. Well, here's to the eye adventure, but there's something about that submarine provoker I can't quite get used to. It seems just a trifle one-sided. However, that is in the lap of the gods. Instead of a camp, I will soon have the vast expanses of the ocean in which to demonstrate my tremendous inability to emulate the example of one John Paul Jones. Bear a hand there, buddy, the P.O. has just cried to me. Buddy, I came in, and buddy, I go out. We're off. I can dimly distinguish Mr. Fogarty, that unscrupulous dog that abandoned my bed and board for a couple of influential yeomen. Farewell, Fogarty. May your evil ways never bring you to grief. I do wish I had a picture of my sweetie. End of Part 10 End of Biltmore Oswald, The Diary of a hapless recruit.